What makes a great boss fight? You can probably think back to some of your favorite boss encounters out there. What makes them stick out to you? Is it the way they looked? Is it the difficulty or the accomplishment you felt when you overcame them? Whether you're designing a game yourself or just want to see what makes bosses tick, today I wanted to take a look at some of the different building blocks that construct a great boss battle. Let's talk about it. Bosses come in all shapes and sizes, but there's something different about them compared to the rest of the enemies in a game. What is that X factor? Well, first off, I think for a boss to be enjoyable, it needs to be challenging. Often bosses are commanders of armies or head honchos of enemy factions. They should put up more of a fight than the average baddie. That being said, it's also important that your boss is fair. No one enjoys a cheap boss battle. If they can't predict what's coming next or be able to avoid damage, a much easier option would be to just quit the game. Make sure attacks are either telegraphed or at least part of a pattern that the player can learn from. The first time a player fights a boss, it might seem overwhelming, but if they keep their cool and learn from their mistakes, they can persevere and feel great doing so. As player skill and knowledge increases, the challenge of a boss should decrease. But if it's too random or cheap, that'll be harder to achieve. In the same vein, avoid padding boss health. An easy way to make a boss harder is to just give it a giant health bar. But this is false difficulty, and honestly uninteresting if that's all that sets a boss apart. Don't get me wrong, a boss should be beefier than other foes, and even harder bosses should be more difficult still. But it's not enjoyable to slowly chip away at a boss's energy meter if the fight doesn't change itself. The Binding of Isaac is an interesting example of this. Because of the random nature of items you can get, some bosses that are supposed to be really hard can become pushovers if you have the right combo of items. So when they released the Afterbirth expansion, they added a few bosses that are just huge damage sponges. Even if you do have great items, these guys take forever to kill, and can become especially frustrating if you don't have a lot of damage or health. So it's a fine line, but making sure a boss is challenging yet fair is essential for fun gameplay. Next, your boss should be intimidating in some way. This is what makes most bosses memorable. It's okay for the player to feel fear as a boss enters the arena, even if you're supposed to feel overpowered in the rest of the game. Player emotion is so important to the overall experience, and challenge combined with an intimidating design can make for a truly memorable fight. That being said, you can also use this concept to subvert player expectations. Shovel Knight comes to mind with how they incorporate Tinker Knight's battle. He's one of the later bosses, so he doesn't seem very tough when you reach him. You can kill this little pipsqueak easily, but then it turns out he has the biggest and baddest machine of them all. What a great moment. Now what's interesting is that you can actually use the opposite of this principle to send a message to the player. Gwyn, Lord of Cinder, is the final boss of Dark Souls. So you'd expect him to turn into the scariest monster you've ever seen, but instead it's just a regular guy while somber music plays in the background. After all the other behemoths you fought up to this point, Gwyn is a huge contrast. But this makes sense with the narrative of Dark Souls. I guess he does have a giant flaming sword though, so he's got that going for him. Third, a boss should test what the player has learned from the game up to that point. Sometimes it can be fun to use a boss as a teaching moment to try out a new ability. This is even more true for end bosses. These should be a final exam of everything the player has learned and put their skills to the test. It may be challenging to pull off in a realistic way, but it always adds bonus points in my book if a boss can uniquely find ways to use special abilities to take them down. Some examples include Gruntilda from Banjo-Kazooie, where you'll be flying around, shooting eggs, and turning invincible to defeat this evil witch, or Mr. Freeze from Arkham City, where you have to use a variety of gadgets to take him down because he adapts and won't make the same mistake twice. This not only keeps a fight fresh, but can cause the player to feel more accomplished in their victory, because they used critical thinking to win, not just brute force. Another thing to consider when designing a boss is what the reward will be for fighting them. Most of the time, the prize is simply progressing the story, working your way from boss to boss as a means of rising action until the climax. But sometimes the player is compensated with a special item or power-up. The Mega Man series is an obvious example of this, and these new abilities can be used for an advantage against later bosses. But occasionally, the boss fight itself can be the reward if it's satisfying enough. Some games will have a secret final boss that's only unlocked after certain requirements are met, and the reward is simply the pride you feel when you best it. These are normally the hardest boss in the game, and can be very exciting, especially if it's a surprise. I think it's important to ask yourself, why am I fighting this boss? And if your answer isn't satisfactory to your overall goals of your game, then change it. 
Finally, great boss fights are ones that stay fresh and unique. Not only should bosses look different from regular enemies, but they should behave differently too. Give them moves that connect with their theming, like a swamp monster causing the screen to go blurry, or a musician attacking you on a giant piano. Many games will reuse the same boss and just give it a color swap and slightly harder patterns, but I would avoid this, it comes across as lazy. Donkey Kong is notorious for doing this, but at least in DK64, your rematch against Dogadon is with a different Kong. So even though the boss was basically the same, it felt different because your your character's abilities had changed. Consider giving each boss multiple phases that change up the battle. Every boss in Wings of V does this, and it keeps you on your toes. Just when you think you're getting good at fighting back, they introduce a whole new set of attacks. The final boss of Castle Crashers has six phases, including one that's a fake out where he turns into a giant spider hiding in the treasure chest. This many phases certainly ramps up the challenge, but you also don't want your bosses to overstay their welcome. As long as it continues to be enjoyable, adding new things is a good idea. It is not easy to make a boss that is both challenging and intimidating, but rewarding and fair. That's why I think it helps to go back and look at some of your favorite bosses that you fought before. In fact, tell me in the comments below some of the bosses you remember most and why you like them so much. And next time you fight a boss, put it to the test. Does it hold up under these principles? Now of course, these are just my ideas. There are other great concepts to incorporate in your boss fights as well. But above all, don't forget that the best bosses are ones that are fun. That's why we play games after all. Thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. Stay frosty, my friends. What defines a roguelike game? You see, roguelikes are some of the most creative and fun games I've played, but the rules seem to vary quite a bit from game to game. It used to include parameters such as turn-based combat or it had to be a dungeon crawler, but they've changed and adapted so much over the years that for the purposes of this video, I'm going to define a roguelike as a game that has randomly generated elements every time you play, and death permanence, a game over means starting from the beginning. But even that has some exceptions. It's a loose definition, but those are the main aspects that set roguelikes apart from most other games. Perhaps a harder question is, what makes roguelikes fun to play? I asked my Twitter followers why they enjoy roguelikes, and I'll be referencing some of those answers throughout this video. I've also asked Josh from Gaming FTL to help me out with this one. Say hi, Josh. Hi folks, today on Good Game Design, let's talk about the nothing held back principle. Man, that's a nice accent. I wanted to discuss Spelunky today and use it as a springboard to talk about roguelikes on a broader spectrum. Spelunky quickly became one of my favorite games a few years ago, and actually is how I got my start here on this channel. Yeah, Spelunky Let's Plays for the win. I tried to focus in on why I loved this game so much, and I think it comes down to how it and several other roguelikes handle difficulty and replayability. Let's start with the difficulty. If you've never played Spelunky before, it's a brutally hard game. Despite its cartoonish atmosphere, Spelunky will kick your ass over and over again. As your treasure hunt leads deeper into the earth, you'll face all sorts of hazards, monsters, and even aliens. Equipped with only a whip, some bombs, and ropes, every step needs to be carefully considered, as it may be your last. But why is it so hard? Well, it employs something we'll call the nothing held back principle. You see, Unlike most games where the difficulty rises as you get further into the game, many roguelikes don't change the pattern of enemies over time at all, and will just be the same level of difficulty from the first time you boot up the game to the hundredth. Of course the game technically gets harder as you enter new biomes, but a giant spider is always going to behave the same way no matter when you encounter it. This is necessary because of how roguelikes are designed. If it's going to be randomly generated every time you play, it has to have all the elements present from the get-go. Unfortunately, this just means that it's going to be a large hurdle to overcome in the beginning. Now on the surface, that might seem like bad game design. Why would you make your game so tough from the start? Wouldn't that make players want to quit if it's too frustrating? And while that can be true to an extent, the challenge is actually a big part of what draws players in. As Peridactyl put it, it's THE genre that encourages you to get better because each experience will be different, so you really gotta know your stuff. Or as Zet237 said, they're unforgiving. They don't say, oh, was that too hard, sorry, but more like get good or die trying. 
but when you finally mastered them, oh boy, you feel like a god. So there's a little bit of the motivational punishment principle going on too. I can't say that I've thrown my controller out of resentment more than I have at Spelunky, and yet I kept coming back to it. As you learn to not break open pots with your whip cause there might be an enemy hiding inside, or to look out for arrow traps before you jump down a ledge, you adjust your play style to overcome the obstacles that bested you so many times before. Except for the shopkeepers, cause those dudes are just made to ruin your day. But seriously, I've only beaten Spelunky a handful of times, and every single win was a triumphant victory because of the challenge. That's what made it so sweet. But all of this would be for nothing if the game didn't feel fair. There's a fine line between hard and cheap, but Spelunky never feels like it wrongs you. Everything is telegraphed, and once you learn an enemy's set patterns, you can predict how they'll react to you and how to take them down. Once you've played a roguelike enough times, you'll have an inbuilt understanding of its systems. That lets you adapt to any variation in its environment. And that is why Spelunky has replayability. If you feel like every hit wasn't justified, you would just quit after the first few lives. But it does feel justified, and you know how to respond differently the next time. But the fact that everything is random keeps you on your toes through every playthrough. As Heavy Eyed put it, it's like gambling. The game of chance in a new setting makes you be like, this time I will get lucky and get it. Or Snooping Turtle who said, roguelikes have replay value because it feels like you're improving with each run. And the length of Spelunky as well as many other roguelikes helps with replayability as well. Most of them are on average about an hour or so to complete. You just have to actually survive long enough to finish them. But this fast pick up and play approach makes the replay value shoot through the roof. Everything is there from the start. You won't have to go through the easy levels to get back to where you were. And you know each attempt is only gonna last you a short amount of time. Not to mention the fact that every game is different so it keeps from getting stale. The final element that keeps roguelikes interesting, especially for me, are the secrets. Sure, there might be a normal way to beat the game, but a lot of roguelikes will have a secret ending or special items that you have to work extra hard to find. Spelunky might be the best example of this. Let me tell you all the requirements to unlock an entire bonus world and second boss fight. In the mines, a golden chest will randomly spawn on one of the levels and you have to find a key on the same floor to unlock it. This will give you the Udjet... Edit this so I don't sound like an idiot. Udjet I. Now, it does more than just show you gems in the wall. It will also start blinking in the jungle when you are close to the secret black market entrance. This is always hidden behind some terrain, so it would be really hard to find without your jet eye. Again, randomly placed every time. In the black market, you can purchase all kinds of upgrades and items, but the important one here is the ank. It's $50,000, so you'll have to save up or brave the onslaught of shopkeepers if you try to steal it. But once you have the ank, you then need to be on the lookout for the moai head in the ice caves. When you see it, you actually need to kill yourself, as the ank will bring you back to life inside the statue, giving you the head jet. In the temple, if you kill Anubis and take his scepter, you can enter the city of gold. But only if you have both the scepter and the head jet. Finally, you can get the Book of the Dead in the City of Gold, which will allow you to enter the secret area called Hell while fighting Olmec, the original final boss. You have to cause Olmec to fall into the lava right underneath the entrance to Hell and use him as a platform to enter. This place is mayhem and will really put the skills that you've learned previously to the test. But the final boss, Yama, is extremely satisfying to fight, and I just love that there's all this extra game to play for those who are up to the challenge. So what makes Spelunky have good game design? Well, What's With Games might have put it best when he said, Roguelikes more than any other genre intertwine player growth and character growth. The length makes them easy to just sit down and have a quick game of, and the randomized experiences of each playthrough lets them never get old. Roguelikes have the ability to make us feel accomplished in ways that many other games can only dream of. It might take days, weeks, months of chipping away at it before you ever beat them, but the feeling you get when you finally do is unparalleled. Watching yourself go from clues and getting destroyed in less than five minutes, to being able to react in every way that you need in order to succeed makes you feel like a better gamer. And probably a better person in general. Put that stuff on your resume. But I hope we'll continue to see more elements of roguelikes inspire games in the future, to branch out and try something new, because there's nothing like them. Tell me in the comments below why you like roguelike games. I'd love to hear it. Thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. Stay frosty, my friends. 
so I've never done a bad game design before. And to kick it off with this game will undoubtedly be controversial. So before we dive in, I'd like to say a couple things. First off, I understand the irony of introducing a series on negatives during the month celebrating my favorite game franchise. And believe me, I was surprised too. But second, I loved this game as a kid. Please don't think that I hold some horrible grudge with DK64. In fact, I beat it 101% and used the strategy guide to the bone when I was younger. It was one of my favorite games on the N64. I know that a lot of people have deep adoration for this game, and it does have a lot going for it. But when I played it again on Virtual Console last year, I realized there are a lot of things that are objectively bad in this game. So I want to talk about it. But of course, I hope you'll understand that I still like this game, and don't mean to offend anyone out there that might hold this as one of their favorites. Now, as I mentioned, it does have some good concepts in place. So let's start by talking about the positives. Donkey Kong 64 was all about making things bigger. There's a huge island to explore. Unlike previous games where you're just hopping from level to level on a picture of an island, you're actually discovering new parts of the world as rocks break apart or new doorways become available. The story itself is bigger. K. Rule doesn't just want your bananas anymore. He's got a giant laser beam pointed at your island. I'd consider the stakes raised. Even the way the atmosphere changes as you go to K. Rule's ship, from a sunny beautiful day to gloomy and rainy, just gives so much character and charm to the world. And that's probably this game's biggest strength its personality. Everything has that rareware charisma and memorability. And I haven't even mentioned the Kongs. You get three brand new ones to play with, and you can learn about them by the DK rap or by just watching them in the tag barrel. Look at Chunky. I love how he doesn't want you to pick him. They all had their own abilities, power-ups, musical instruments, and even freaking guns. But you see, this is where the flaws start to come through. The game had incredible scope, and the ideas were solid on paper, but they could have been executed much better in the actual game. There's a lot of things I could talk about in regards to what's wrong with DK64, but none of them are the major issue I had except one of them. I could talk about how there are just too many collectibles. This is a very common complaint I hear about this game, but it never really bothered me that much. Sure, there are some items that are a little unnecessary, and they use gating to make some of them feel more important, but when you compare it to other collectathons of the era, it's really not that bad. It gives you more things to do, and I don't find that a bad thing. I could talk about the bad camera and controls, the glitches or frame rate issues. And while this did hinder my experience greatly and frustrated me to no end, I chalk all that up to the limitations of the N64 and developers still figuring things out in 3D space. It certainly wasn't the only game around this time to have these problems, and it also explains why they had to reuse some of the bosses for multiple fights. I could talk about the misuse of bonus barrels and how they were more of a nuisance than an actual bonus. The placement often seemed completely random, and the games themselves were either really annoying to complete or entirely broken. Beaver, bother, come on! They repeated the same games over and over, but to be fair, that's an issue Donkey Kong has always had, from the original trilogy all the way to the new generation of titles. In fact, DK64 actually had way more variety in the bonus games. They just weren't fun to play. I literally just started to avoid them by the end of the game. I could talk about the underutilization of the animal buddies. These are some of my favorite parts of the series and always made levels more enjoyable, or at the very least, helped you clear hard sections. In DK64, they're extremely limited, only showing up in small areas of levels, and are used but a handful of times for a couple golden bananas and a few minigames. Not to mention, we can only play as Rambi and Unguard? Give me Squitter, Rattly, Espresso. Heck, use Squawks to fly around instead of just telling me some dialogue or tutorials. This is a big problem with the new games as well, though. Come on, Retro Studios, we need more animal buddies. Finally, this one's a bit personal, but I could talk about how annoying the Donkey Kong arcade game was to complete for the Nintendo coin. Like, this would be a fun Easter egg, but it's required to beat the game. And it's not even so much that it's really hard, but you have to re-pull the lever every time you die, and it just takes forever. <sighs> okay, but none of these issues are what bothered me most when I replayed through this game. It all boils down to one major problem that's pervasive through the entire experience, and that's how segmented it was. Every single collectible in this game that has value is designated to a specific Kong for them to collect. Not just the golden bananas, but the colored bananas, the banana coins, the blueprints, the banana medals, and even a lot of non-collectibles. The switches, the pads, certain doorways, the gun switches, the music pads, the animal buddies, even the boss fights. Everything is separated from each other. And a 
assigned to a specific situation in which you need a particular Kong and their abilities to reach it. Now, why is this a bad thing? On a pause screen, everything looks neat and organized, five bananas for each Kong, etc. Well, let's start small. Look at the opening section for Gloomy Galleon. Just in the first hallway, you have blue, green, and purple bananas, so you'd have to backtrack here three different times just to collect a few measly bananas. But that's not all that's here. There's also gun switches for Diddy, Chunky, and Donkey Kong, Simi and Slam switches for Lanky and Tiny, not to mention a Kremlin to kill for a blueprint, and a ton of these banana balloons that always happen to be placed in the most inconvenient places, all of which need to be collected with different Kongs. Now sure, this could easily be done in a few minutes with a couple quick trips to the tag bank barrel, but this is just flat ground that's easily accessible. Now look at the climb you have to do in Frantic Factory. This does the same thing with placing different colored bananas all up the tower, but with a much more perilous and time-consuming journey than before. And this wouldn't be too bad as just a few specific examples, but the thing is, this is the whole game. Every string of bananas has to have at least three colors. Areas that lure you in with a specific Kong will also have other collectibles for different Kongs, just so you'll have to come back here again later to collect them. You can't walk five steps in a new world without needing to switch in the tag barrel if you want to collect everything as you go. It won't even let you gather your correctly colored bananas if you transform into an animal buddy. Now, Creepy Castle is probably my favorite level in the game from a design perspective, because they finally decided to place bananas in areas that make sense. When you start this level, you can collect 50 bananas in a row with Donkey Kong, then 50 more in a row with Tiny, and it will help you explore the entirety of the castle exterior, giving you all the warp pads in the process. This is so much better! I didn't feel like I had to go back to a tag barrel every minute, and it helped me get familiar with the level without halting my progress. Unfortunately, the rest of the game does not follow this example. The majority of it feels like a hassle, an out of the way ordeal, and it didn't have to be that way. And these are just the small fry items. Let's talk about the golden bananas, the main collectible in the game. As I mentioned, every golden banana is designated to a specific Kong and will use their abilities to reach them. The problem is that this will often lead to many different areas that are just cut off from other Kongs, or a bunch of little rooms that only certain Kongs can enter. It becomes a game of hit this switch or play this instrument five different times to have the same outcome. Instead of a connected world where you have to use the Kongs to work together, it feels like five separate games layered on top of each other. They do tasks alone, and need to be switched out all the time if you want to get enough collectibles to progress in the game. Even if a banana is accessible to every Kong, it'll be grayed out unless the right character comes to pick it up. What if instead of isolated efforts, you could get bananas with any Kong, and give multiple options to get them? Why does every Kong have to have an even number of bananas? In the original trilogy, it showed whichever Kong you beat the level with on the map screen, and you could start to see which Kong you favored more. It doesn't require you to beat a certain amount of levels with each Kong. It lets you decide that Dixie is obviously the best choice and you should never choose Kitty, but why not let DK64 have this kind of competition as well? Have the stat screen show which Kong has collected the most golden bananas and regular bananas. Don't restrict your favorite Kongs from being useful. I assume they designed it this way to make each Kong feel valuable and like they're used evenly, but you could still make them valuable without the limitations. What if there were many ways of getting a banana high up in the air, like Lanky's float ability or Tiny's hairspin? What if Donkey Kong could turn invisible to reach a lever that opens a door, but you could also open it with Chunky by throwing a rock at it or use Diddy's head bash. Give the player more freedom to explore with whichever Kong they want. Some things are segregated for seemingly no reason, like the boss fights. Why do I have to fight Dogadon as Chunky here? Look, he doesn't even want to fight him himself. Why not give me the option to get huge and beat him up, or use Diddy's jetpack to fly behind him and hit a sweet spot, or shrink down with Tiny and climb him Shadow of the Colossus style? Okay, maybe that's a little too ambitious, but you see where I'm going with this. It would not only give more options to play the game with, but provide a ton of replayability where you could try battles again with different Kongs. Heck, maybe even challenge runs, like beating the game with only one Kong. In theory, it made sense to have a wide variety of scenarios in which you collect bananas, but what it felt like was five separate treasure hunts happening at the same time. And there are some things that don't require a specific Kong to do, like taking pictures of the banana fairies, getting the rareware coin, or the arena battles. So it's not even consistent, it feels like some things were decided randomly to be separated between Kongs or not. Now there is one example of this game using the various abilities in a fantastic way, and that is the final boss fight. 
This battle is really long, and actually can be really frustrating if you die in the last section, but it uses every Kong and a vast array of their abilities, all on one specific foe, King K. Rule. One phase you'll be destroying the lights with Diddy, and the next you're crawling into his shoe to tickle his toes with Tiny. I would have loved to see more of this in the rest of the game. Do part of the task with one Kong, then finish the job with another. Like destroying layers of a fruit hut by using each gun to reach the center, or put a boss to sleep with Chunky's triangle while you deal damage, but then wake him up to move him with Diddy's guitar. Anything to use the different abilities in a cohesive way, instead of an exclusive one. My whole point in critically looking at a beloved game from over 15 years ago is to look at the future. Obviously DK64 is way old and there's no reason to want to change it for its purposes alone, but this kind of thing is important to think about as games continue to evolve. With a small resurgence of collectathons coming and the old team coming back together to make ukulele, I hope to see more creativity than ever with the genre. Please understand that all of this critique comes out of a love for this type of game, and wanting to improve it even more. It looks like Ukulele will be focusing on interconnected and ever-expanding worlds to try things that haven't been done before. I'm nervous and excited at the same time to see how it turns out, but I hope we can learn from mistakes in the past to help improve games that have yet to come. That wraps up our first ever bad game design. I promise the next one won't be so negative. Thanks for watching. Open world games are a dime a dozen. Seriously, if shooters were the defining genre of the 2000s, open world games might be what defines the current decade, and because they're everywhere and so commonly produced, they sort of get a bad rap. If a game has open world elements, it's often seen as a negative nowadays. So today on Good Game Design, I wanted to discuss the problems with the genre, and how two new games have made valiant efforts at improving them. Let's talk about it. So what exactly is wrong with open world games? Running around in a giant sandbox, being able to do whatever you want sounds amazing on paper, limitless possibilities and all that, but I think most open world games make two fatal flaws in their designs. One, they actively try to narrow down your experience into a much more linear one, and two, any bonus content you can do is pointless and uneventful. A good friend of mine and fellow content creator Rasbutin made a couple videos that I highly recommend checking out. Minimaps are stupid, and I hate fast travel. I promise they're not as pessimistic as they sound. It's more just taking a look at common problems that open world games face and offering some suggestions of how to resolve it. I'll give you the Cliff Notes version here though. Many maps, while an innocent attempt at giving you more information about the giant world you're exploring, become bogged down with clutter really easily, and waypoint markers of your next objective can force you to look at a tiny dot on your screen instead of taking in your surroundings. It also frees developers of the need to create intuitive level design because you're always guided to your next mission via a simple line or direction arrow. Fast travel can also be a huge detriment to the open-ended nature these games are trying to convey. With no punishment for instantly teleporting, you have zero incentive to walk across the map yourself once you discover a location, and again, it makes the purpose of having a giant wasteland to explore meaningless. Often movement itself isn't fun, and there isn't anything to do in between destinations, so why not fast travel? But the bigger problem I have with open world games is that all the extra side quests you're given are not only excessive and overwhelming, but often dumb and serve no purpose. The majority of these side missions simply reward you with more experience, or extra money, or maybe a good weapon if you're lucky, but is this really worth the hassle of helping out a villager with a fetch quest, or finding all the collectibles in the city if there's no decent reward for doing so? Even worse is when the activity itself is boring and disconnected from the overall story or theme of the game. I want to slay monsters, not catch red frogs. And god forbid if I have to go bowling with my cousin again. I find myself asking, so what's the point when I'm doing anything other than the main missions? And that's a surefire sign of shallow padding. So how do we fix it? Horizon Zero Dawn came out a few weeks ago, and I was pleasantly surprised by how it tackled a lot of these issues. You can instantly journey to any campfire that you've discovered on the map, but it now costs a fast travel pack to execute, which uses up resources you've collected from the environment. This makes each time you fast travel carry much more weight, as you can't just do it infinitely anymore. But the world of Horizon Zero Dawn is a big place, so when you're navigating normally, you can override machines to ride them and go much faster. These encounters in and of themselves are enjoyable, and you have to be stealthy to pull them off. Besides, it's important to hike by foot anyway to get the resources you need to craft arrows or healing items. While Horizon uses an intuitive waypoint system that adapts to your surroundings, you have the ability to turn the entire HUD off altogether, and be able to take in the beautiful scenery around you as you explore the valleys and mountaintops of this world. 
Most significant, however, is that the variety of side quests are actually valuable to do. To reveal more of your map, you can climb tall necks and hack into their system, but doing so is extremely satisfying and fun, and each one presents new challenges of how to complete your task. Cauldrons are complex shelters full of monsters, but if you clear them out, it gives you knowledge of how to override even more machines as you journey to new locations. Overall, the side quests improve yourself as a character, and in more ways than just experience or skill points, it enhances the gameplay itself as you unlock new ways to play the game or discover hidden secrets. That being said, it does seem to get repetitive after a while, and the environments aren't exactly intuitive to navigate. What if another game took these improvements and went a step further? Further. Enter Breath of the Wild. Our latest Zelda adventure is similar to Horizon Zero Dawn in a lot of ways. And no, not just because they both like shooting arrows at robots. The same advancements are here in Breath of the Wild. The Pro HUD turns everything off except for your hearts, making for true exploration without a constant reminder of where you're supposed to be. And while you can fast travel whenever you'd like, you can only transport to shrines or towers, not every single place you've discovered. And you're encouraged to trek everywhere because all of the extra things you can do have actual value for growing as a player. The shrines give you spirit orbs that can increase your hearts or stamina when you collect four of them, Kurok seeds can be found by solving simple little puzzles throughout the world, and these are used to upgrade your weapon, shield, or bow slots to carry more equipment. Killing enemies and gathering their body parts are not only useful for cooking elixirs, but also for upgrading your armor at the great fairy fountains. And even memories can be triggered by finding locations that match these photos you're given by Impa, and these give you backstory of what happened 100 years ago before Link lost his memory. Everything has a purpose, and it's so much more than just money or completionism. In fact, Breath of the Wild pulled off something that every other game strives to do. It made each task and location unique, creative, and fun. I feel like you don't need a minimap to explore Hyrule. There's something waiting to be discovered around every corner. And no matter where you traverse, you're gonna find something interesting and rewarding. It's a map that was carefully crafted to be explored. And even the same tasks you have to do over and over are all distinctive from each other, like the towers that fill in your map. Yes, you have to climb to the top of each one, but they all have different obstacles along the way, like purple goop blocking the path or simply not having any ledges to rest on, so you need to fly in from above. All of the dungeons are similar in that you need to find a way to enter them and interact with the five modules to take control of their body, but each one is so vastly different from the last and were very memorable experiences. Even the shrines blew me away with how diverse they were from each other. Not only are there 120 of these things, but they can all be completed right from the get-go. Nothing is gated from the beginning. And this sense of openness is only reinforced by how realistic the game's physics are. Want to create a giant snowball? You can do that. Want to climb that mountain in the distance? You can do that. Want to dress like a woman and ride a sand seal? Normal Saturday night. In fact, Zelda dared to do something most any other game would never dream of. You're able to go right to the end as soon as you leave the Great Plateau. Why would you create all this extra stuff to do, but then allow the player to skip it all and just beat the game in the first hour? Now, obviously this is easier said than done, and they definitely recommend that you don't do this, but the fact that it's possible is so important. This means that everything you do in this game is your choice. And this is exactly what an open world game should be all about. It's almost the polar opposite of other Zelda games. The joke in Ocarina of Time was that you're supposed to be saving the world, but instead you're fishing or catching chickens. But here it's like, well, you could fight Ganon, but why don't you go recruit some help first by wandering across the land? The only quest you're given at the start is to defeat Ganon, and how you decide to tackle that is up to you. It even makes fun of you a little bit if you don't know where to go and ask for help. Like, come on, have a little more resolve than that, you can figure it out. And this is all intentional. The driving force behind every design choice Nintendo makes here is discovery. It's fascinating when you start to see all the little details they threw in. Hetsu, the maraca-shaking broccoli tree, is purposefully placed on your way to Kakariko Village in the beginning. This is the only direction you're given, and the developers wanted to make sure you knew what the purpose of Kurok Seeds were early on. But he only lets you upgrade a couple times before he heads off towards his home in the north. If you want to upgrade your weapon slots further, you need to explore and find him again. When I first left the Great Plateau, the first thing I found wasn't a horse or a simple shrine, but instead a giant rock monster like, what? Look how far he hits me! There 
there's a bunch of these mini bosses all over the world and this is one way to find out about them. Okay, get this, you can find a lady just cooking some meals on a cliffside and she'll tell you the recipes she's made but they're all bad and will only create dubious food that's so gross you can't even look at it, it's pixelated. But like, I should have known because she sucks at cooking. Look at that, she burnt the meat. And if you stand on this bridge and look out, a guy stops you and tries to talk you out of committing suicide. Like, don't do it man, there's so much to live for. I can't even begin to describe how unique every single area is. The detail is unreal and I never felt like I was seeing the same thing twice. Perhaps what games these days struggle with most is keeping things fresh. An enemy might be cool the first time you see it, but by the 20th it's repetitive. I never got that feeling with Breath of the Wild. Every choice I made was my own, and the world encouraged me to do just that. It is truly a game that gives you the freedom to explore and rewards you when you do. Not with pointless experience, but with tangible benefits that have caused me to become hopelessly addicted to flying around Hyrule in hopes of finding every little secret. This is what an open world game should be, and I don't know if I've ever seen a game that executes it so perfectly. Thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a world to explore. Stay frosty, my friends. Atmosphere. Immediately that word might make you think of scenery or a world that you're placed in. And in movies or books that will probably be the case, but in the interactive medium of video games, a lot more can be at play here. Let's talk about it. So what makes a game have good atmosphere? Well, I think that while a game doesn't have to be realistic, it needs to be believable. Part of the reason we play games, after all, is to escape reality and play in a fantastical world. And it's easier to do this when a game's environment is authentic and cohesive. In Bioshock, for example, Rapture is an intricate underwater city that's run by a fictional resource called Plasmids, which you discover ended up being the same city's downfall. Little intricacies and hidden backstories are some of what make a fabricated world click with us as a player. And certainly the art design helps with this. The more detail in the visuals, the easier it is to get sucked into a universe. But other factors are involved here too, including pacing, game feel, heck, even the music and sound effects. And none of these could get the job done on their own. Now, it's important to note that games with good atmosphere aren't locked into a particular genre. It can fit all sorts of different moods and playstyles. Look at Metal Gear Rising Revengeance. I've played a lot of campy over-the-top games, but this one might be the hypest. Everything here screams Saturday morning cartoon, and it sets that tone right from the get-go. You're immediately thrust into battle with a giant robot, and even though it keeps coming back for more, you can chop it up with ease. It makes you feel extremely powerful, but then the villains you face are even stronger and put you in your place. This raises the stakes and delivers high-octane action for the whole experience. And the entire world complements this tone, from the cheesy dialogue to the epic music playing as you slice everything standing in your way to bits. Oh man, it feels good! Now look at a game like Braid almost the polar opposite in terms of gameplay, pace, and atmosphere. The theme here is keep calm and puzzle on. <laughs> That's still a popular reference, right? I mean, don't get me wrong, some of these puzzles are mind-bending, but the environment in which you do them is entirely non-threatening. Soothing music plays in the background as you travel to different cutesy locations with even cuter enemies. Fear of death is non-existent because you can just rewind time and try again. Braid wants you to take a step back, breathe, and focus on the puzzles. And the atmosphere helps in doing so, there isn't much else to worry about. It's not tense, there's no time limit, it's simple. And yet, this is such a contrast from the ending. Maybe Braid's atmosphere is a facade to catch you by surprise here, because whoo, it's a doozy. What's fascinating though is that both of these examples use their atmosphere to guide you into a certain playstyle. While Metal Gear urges you to be aggressive and rip out people's hearts, Braid trains you to act slow and think deeply. And this isn't accomplished by a direct push or instruction, but rather by the immersion in their respective worlds. But what's interesting is that the games we say have the best atmosphere tend to be ones that are desolate, spooky, and empty. There's something exceptionally eerie about having to explore a world alone. I think of Portal, which thrusts you into a pristine, white-walled testing chamber with an unintentionally funny narrator guiding you through the different rooms. Things start simple enough, yet you can't help but think that something is off here. It's too good to be true, especially when you start to face danger like pools of acid or turrets shooting at anything that moves. The cracks start to show, you question why you're truly here. I mean, it's starting to look more like a torture chamber rather than one for testing. That's why it's so satisfying when you find the Ratman's hideouts. 
This is the perfect detail that adds to the game's unsettling atmosphere. You knew it couldn't be real, there had to be some ulterior motive going on. He warns you of the upcoming danger, and when that's finally realized, this gives you motivation to track down GLaDOS and exact your revenge in the final battle. Portal does an incredible job of teaching you your goals simply through its aesthetic, and ironically it seems more believable because of the imperfections, rather than its perfections. But perhaps the granddaddy of them all, the game that's cited for its atmosphere more than any other, is Super Metroid. An intergalactic bounty hunter investigating a disturbingly bleak alien planet makes for some pretty spooky moments. And like Metal Gear Rising, Super Metroid's tone and themes are established within the first minutes of the game. Isolation, exploration, and growth. Let's talk about title screens for a second. On the Super Nintendo, what do most of these look like? Happy, simple little vignettes showing you basic mechanics or giving you a taste of what the gameplay will look like? Now look at Super Metroid's title screen. Death, eerie music, creepy sounds. You're shown that this will be an isolated, chilling experience from the first seconds of booting up the game. It doesn't hold anything back, and maybe that's why this game didn't interest me that much as a kid. It was frightening and mysterious. And sure enough, as you begin your journey, it's empty. You are truly alone. And that makes it even more terrifying when space pirates and aliens do show up. There's no one here to help you. You have to do this mission on your own. Yet, you do have a mission. So you show up at the space colony and are confronted with two major problems. Everyone is dead, you need to get to the bottom of it. And Ridley, the leader of the space pirates who stole the last Metroid, just wrecks you. You don't even stand a chance, and he escapes. So this sets up two motivational points for the player, retrieving what was lost and growing stronger. And how do you accomplish these goals? by exploring the world. As you dive deeper into this foreign planet, you'll gain all sorts of power-ups along the way. And this not only makes exploration easier, but helps you defeat enemies quicker as well. Some of the foes that deflected all your shots in the beginning can now be taken down with ease, as you develop skill as a player and as a character. And perhaps what stuck out to me most while playing was how real Zebus felt as an actual place. Super Metroid's sound design is out of this world. <laughs> the music is more ambient, focusing on fitting with each area rather than being memorable. And all the little sound effects give so much character to the world. Does anyone else think it's weird that these guys are supposed to be space pirates, but they're like, dragon people? I've never seen something like that before, and it's definitely not what I picture when I think of pirates. But that's cool, and it makes me want to learn more about them. Power-ups could have just been sitting on regular pedestals, but instead they seem to be treasures of a forgotten race. But some of them are still alive? Oh man! And sure, there are some items that you gain by defeating bosses, but many of them are just in hidden alcoves, or simply rewards for searching every nook and cranny of the environment. Necessary power-ups for beating the game are just waiting to be found by a searching mind. If you accidentally fall down a large pit, you won't be able to get back up until you find the right item. But that's exactly what your goal is anyway, to become more powerful as you explore. And then, when you finally do confront Ridley again, it's so satisfying to take him down. All of your hard work paid off, and you feel a stronger connection with Samus and her motives. Everything in Super Metroid is trying to convey its major themes, and they do so by letting the gameplay shine and providing a mysterious setting to explore. From the variety of enemies you'll face, to the godlike level design, to simply the soundtrack. All of it combines into a phenomenal atmosphere. When you look at a game through the lens of its atmosphere, it sort of changes how you perceive it. You can start to understand how the developers intended you to experience their game. And if the atmosphere fits well with the gameplay, whether it's campy, calming, isolating, or epic, it makes for a grand adventure that you won't soon forget. Can you think of some games that have great atmosphere? Ones that draw you in with its tone and themes and then reinforce them throughout the experience? And maybe think of other genres that can still have great atmosphere as well. Tell me in the comments below and let's talk about it. Thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. Stay frosty, my friends. Thanks to the rise of Twitch and events like Games Done Quick, it seems like video game speedrunning is becoming a lot more common and spreading to a wider audience. While not every gamer is going to be pulling off frame-perfect tricks to beat a game in world record time, more and more people appear to be getting into it, and casually running through their favorite games as fast as they can. 
Because of this, it begs the question of what developers should do to make their games as speedrunning friendly as possible. So today on Good Game Design, whether you're an up-and-coming dev, a speedrunner yourself, or just a fan of the spectacle, let's talk about why this is so important. Speedrunning could certainly still be seen as a niche fan base. So why should a developer focus on them? Well, I think speedrunning can change a person's perspective of a game. It teaches them to look at it from different angles and learn techniques to best it in multiple ways. While a game might have a normal solution to a puzzle, a speedrunner could find a myriad of different ways to get past it, and over time they become a more adept player of games in general. Speedrunning can increase reaction time, spatial awareness, and problem solving abilities, teaching players to push games to their limits. Encouraging this mindset will only increase the variety and originality of games we'll see in the future. Now, of course, there's no such thing as a perfect game to speedrun, and everyone's different preferences and playstyles will determine the titles they enjoy most. But I've come up with a few guidelines that can help a game become enjoyable for a wide assortment of speedrunners, and as inviting as possible. It's important to remember that a speedrunner will be playing through a game hundreds, sometimes thousands of times. So while a certain experience can be enjoyable the first time, it could easily get frustrating after the tenth, let alone hundredth. First off, let's talk about cycles. Now, what the heck do I mean by cycles? Let me show you an example. In the musically driven platformer 140, these ledges will appear and disappear to the beat of the song, and you're supposed to wait for the right timing to jump across. But if you're fast enough, you can actually complete it like this. As a speedrunner, there's nothing worse than coming up on an obstacle and having to wait for the next cycle to come around and pick you up. It's best to have objects timed so the player can speed through stages without having to slow down. But this presents a problem from a game design perspective. You don't want someone to just be able to hold right and beat a level with no effort. So how do you accommodate both issues? Well, most games opt to have the best cycles occur if the player moves through the level at the fastest rate possible, so they can catch the quickest route if they time it right, while slower players might have to face other challenges. Of course, the difficulty is still there for speedrunners, because they have to pull off the techniques in order to have a flawless run of a level. So usually, it's good to always allow the player to keep moving if they want to, and at their own pace. Super Meat Boy is a great example. Because the stages are relatively small, it's easy to construct them in a way that can be completed lightning fast if the player is speedy enough to catch the right cycles. Very rarely will you ever have to wait for the game to catch up to you, and it feels satisfying to zoom through at whatever pace you want. This is why auto-scrollers are normally looked down upon from the speedrunning community, because you have to wait for the game to move at its own pace, and is why you hear this a lot during GDQ marathons. So another uh, auto-scroller right there if you want to do some donations. Sure. It's easy and mindless for most runners. They'd rather be going fast. Similarly, RNG can greatly affect how a run proceeds. If you're unaware, this stands for Random Number Generator, and refers to anything in the game that has random elements, such as a boss's attack patterns, or certain items that drop from slain foes. Sometimes the optimal route of a speedrun will have a low percentage of success because of RNG, causing the run to be reset over and over again until they get the right outcome. Now, having some randomness can actually be a good thing. It keeps games interesting and causes players to think on their feet, sometimes having to resort to backup strategies. But if a run has too much RNG, it can quickly become frustrating to play, especially if it occurs late in the game. Grunty's Furnace Fun in Banjo-Kazooie is notorious for being a run killer, because the Grunty questions are randomly generated each time you start a new game, meaning the correct answer will change every time you play. Therefore, you only have a 1 in 3 chance of getting the answer correct, which could easily waste time or, worse, launch you off into the lava if it's a death square. And being right before the final boss fight makes this section extremely punishing. Roguelikes are an interesting exception to this guideline, even though almost the entirety of these games are based around RNG. The levels, pickups, enemies, and more are often completely different each run, which would seem discouraging to a player, except that they're designed around it. Roguelike speedruns are very short and can be restarted with ease. Even though the exact placements are random, runners can normally sense patterns of the procedurally generated world and adapt accordingly. In fact, roguelikes are all about adaptability. This type of game may not appeal to all speedrunners, but it's worth mentioning that it can work in some contexts. If you do get a run where everything clicks, the results can be astonishing. Next up, it's incredibly helpful to make cutscenes or any form of waiting skippable. 
Sometimes designers don't want a player to miss any important exposition, but after seeing it once, it's nice to be able to pass over it in future playthroughs. Super Mario Sunshine has a nearly 8 minute opening cutscene that can't be skipped, even after beating the game, so every speedrun has to start by watching it. Woo, better get comfy. Hindsight is 2020 though, and a lot of games today have the option to skip things like this, thank goodness. Likewise, bosses that have invulnerability periods can become annoying, because again, you're just waiting around. Generally speaking, it feels better to be able to hit a boss at all times. Not only because it can save time, but it feels more satisfying knowing that you completed the battle faster because of your own speed, not the speed of the boss. Luckily, some games are starting to incorporate speedrun modes that can cut down on a lot of tedium, like Axiom Verge placing a timer on screen and removing all dialogue and cutscenes, or Fury completely eliminating the walking sections in between bosses, and instead taking you right to the next fight without any downtime. Little things like this can cause a game's longevity for speedrunning to skyrocket. This might not seem like a big deal, but including in-game leaderboards of the fastest times for stages can immensely help speedrunners improve and hone their craft. This not only allows for individual level practice, but also encourages competition with the leaderboards, especially if you can compare against your friends' times. Pushing your players to think about speed and how they play can be as simple as including a timer option, or having specific achievements for beating the game in under a certain amount of time. This can help casual players dip their toes into speedrunning without having to practice for an unrealistic amount of time, and can be a fun inclusion for completionists that completely changes how you tackle a game. Let's talk about sequence breaking. Without a doubt, speedrunners will find ways to dismantle a game, and use glitches or exploits to go far beyond the intended way to play. While there are glitchless categories and some viewers enjoy the traditional runs more, sequence breaking is unavoidable for any percent runners. They're just trying to beat the game as fast as possible. Now, this might sound weird, but if you come across some of these tricks in playtesting or watching speedrunners, consider leaving them in your game, to a degree. Obviously this will come down to developer discretion, but sometimes it can be really cool to see an unintentional way to beat a certain section of a game, and can make for some of the most entertaining speedruns to watch. Yacht Club games often will pop their heads in during Shovel Knight runs at a GDQ, and most of the time get their minds blown seeing runners destroy their levels in unique and crazy ways. But rather than go and patch these exploits out, they decide to embrace the speedrunning community, and leave them in as little easter eggs for those searching for it. But perhaps a step further, consider intentionally putting in speedier options for more skilled players. Maybe the best example of this is Super Metroid including the wall jump ability. It introduces it fairly late in your first playthrough, so you may not even know it exists, but you actually have this capability to scale walls from the very start of the game. And while it is hard to pull off, it allows the player to go to certain places long before they're supposed to. Now, runners probably have taken it further than the devs originally intended, but the idea is excellent, and I'd love to see more games in the future take this idea and run with it. Reward the players that are exceptionally talented at your game. Last, but possibly most important, have fun movement. Speedrunners are going to gravitate toward the games they love, but it can only help to have a variety of options when it comes to how they move within them. Similar to having good cycles, flow is so important to how a game feels, and when you're able to climb buildings or rush across landscapes with many different tactics at your disposal, it helps the player feel empowered. Super Mario 64 has some of the most enticing speedruns out there, because runners will use the plumber's tool belt of abilities to speed through stages in ways that some have never thought of before, combining side flips, wall kicks, dives, and triple jumps to reach hidden stars in mere seconds feels incredible. Now, this also runs the risk of making a game too easy if the player can just zoom past all the obstacles, so sometimes a way to add challenge is to have a cost to the benefit of moving quickly. In Spyro speedruns, you're almost always using the charge ability to run faster, but your turning is vastly decreased with this move, so it raises the skill needed to pull off tricks efficiently. Movement might seem like the most obvious part of a speedrun, but it can also be the trickiest thing to get right from a design perspective. Overall, having lots of options and different ways to string movement together to make an impressive advance on a level can be the bread and butter of a successful speedrun. 
All of these options might seem like an afterthought to include in game design, especially if it's a slower paced game or not designed with speed in mind. But a few tweaks here and there can go a long way in making it more accessible to speedrunners, casually or professionally. We've seen a lot of strides taken from developers to include speedrun modes or other features that can enhance replayability, while some tried and true methods from the past are still just as relevant as today. So does a game have to include these guidelines to be considered good? Of course not, but as the community of speedrunners grow, I can only see it being a good thing if creators take notice and help improve game speedrunning quality in the future, to continue pushing boundaries and helping gamers think outside the box for years to come. What are some things that you think a developer could do to make a title even more intriguing to speedrun? If you run games yourself, what are the qualities you look for when picking a title? Tell me in the comments below and let's talk about it. Thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. Thanks for watching and stay frosty, my friends. Celeste has quickly become a force to be reckoned with and easily one of the most recommended titles to be covered here on Good Game Design. I'll admit that at first I was having a hard time loving it, the controls seemed a bit inconsistent, and I wasn't sure how I felt about the combination of art styles going on, but as I persevered through each chapter, something elegant started to form. I gained an understanding of every technique, as well as the charming tale it was trying to tell. Today on Good Game Design, let's talk about how Celeste presents such a beefy amount of gameplay and manages to nail every aspect. Like all great platformers, Celeste isn't complicated. There's only three core abilities, jumping, dashing, and climbing walls. That's all you need to conquer the ominous mountain that lies before you. But the way it manages to stay fresh from start to finish is due to the sheer amount of varying gimmicks. Every single chapter has at least three new elements that switch up the gameplay, but often even more than that from fluid space blocks that you can glide through, to grumpy stone face guys that can be moved with a dash, to the free-flowing feather that allows you to move in any direction for a short time. Just when you think you have a particular skill mastered, it'll throw in more curveballs and build on top of the previous mechanics to test you even further. What surprised me, however, was how wonderfully the story fit right into the gameplay. Of course, climbing Celeste Mountain won't be easy, so along the way, your doubts and fears manifest themselves into what I can only describe as your dark side, and this demon-like version of yourself will tease and torment as you try to complete chapters, eventually leading to a full confrontation of an epic boss battle. As you become more adept at tackling the obstacles in your way, the protagonist, Madeline, overcomes her own fears and leads to a phenomenal final chapter where not only do you reach the summit, but learn to believe in yourself and trust that you can defeat anything that stands in your way. It'll still be extremely tough, and believe me, there is a lot more waiting for you when you finish the base experience, but in a lot of ways, we have to vanquish our own doubts in our ability to finish these types of games. Probably the coolest example of this is Madeline thinking about keeping a feather afloat to calm herself down, and then implementing that concept as an actual system later on, a clever way to tell the player to keep their cool as well. While we may not be able to outrun these negative thoughts, we can learn from our mistakes and become a stronger person because of them. It's a powerful message, and done in a tastefully captivating way. But now, after finishing everything this game has to offer, from collecting all the strawberries, to the B-side and even C-side challenges, what I appreciate more than anything else from a game design perspective is how flawlessly Celeste teaches you about its massive arsenal of mechanics. Let's break it down a little bit. Right from the first stage, you're shown the basic features of springs, spikes, and diamonds that replenish your dash, but it also has these moving traffic lights that fit the city theme aesthetically, but conveniently also teach you about momentum, which becomes a primary focus of traversal later on. Straight into World 2, it introduces those goopy space blocks I mentioned earlier to get around, but before you can feel comfortable with that, your shadow starts following behind you. So you have to complete increasingly difficult rooms along with the looming threat of moving too slowly or retracing your steps and meeting your demise. Chapter 3 might be one of the most cohesive stories in itself, as you journey through Mr. Oshiro's hotel, cleaning up junk to clear pathways, and realizing it's Oshiro's own insecurities that are causing the chaos around you. More and more of these black fuzzy blobs start appearing the deeper you get into the resort, and it caps off with a final chase sequence where you have to avoid Oshiro himself while going through a gauntlet of what the stage has taught you. 
The Golden Ridge is also quite cohesive, beginning with clouds to bounce on, green bubbles that give you a boost, pesky wind to throw off your sense of speed, and these arrow blocks that have adjustable trajectories as you cling on for dear life. But by the end, it will expand your knowledge of how they operate. Pink clouds disappear after one bounce. Wind can be used as an advantage, just as much as a disadvantage. And sometimes you'll have to move obstacles out of the way to keep those necessary platforms alive. And then, of course, it melds them all together. You see, this is the recurring theme I started to notice with Celeste. Each chapter will propose new pieces to the puzzle, but they're taught individually at first, and then built upon as you progress. So eventually, you're flying through insane tests of endurance like it's nothing, because it prepared you for the journey every step of the way. Chapter 5 and 6 continue the trend. Red bubbles are similar to their green counterparts, but they continue the current path until they hit a wall. These gem-covered outcroppings move on a track every time you dash, expanding on the momentum taught in World 1. But this time, you control when the platforms move, leading to some mind-bending puzzles. The finale involves spooky beholder monsters that'll swallow you whole, making it start to feel similar to the Oshiro chase scene, but now they home in on you in any direction. The next area, entitled Reflection, starts in a serene garden while presenting the aforementioned feather and grumpy blocks, as well as these bumpers that can launch you great distances, or into a wall of spikes if you're not careful. And yep, you guessed it, this leads to combinations of all three, bumpers into feathers into moving blocks, all while tackling a climactic boss sequence against your darker self. Now, chapter 7 and 8 decide to switch things up by adjusting your core abilities in addition to new features. You gain a second dash maneuver for the final ascent as you go back through harder versions of all the previous levels, but using this newfound freedom to reach even higher heights along the way, ending with wind that moves up and down instead of left and right for a final test of everything you've learned up until this point. Then, if you're resourceful enough to collect four colored hearts by either completing B-side challenges or scouring the areas for cryptic secrets, it unlocks the core, which is my favorite level in the entire game. Yet again, it changes your default capabilities by not recharging a dash when you touch the ground. So now, the only way to get those dashes back is by collecting a replenish diamond. But that's simply the tip of the iceberg, as it hurls you through a cavern of fire and ice, swapping the temperatures with a flick of a switch and changing everything about the rooms constantly. Fireballs that should be avoided become stepping stones of ice. Bouncy platforms that launch you high into the air now are brittle and shatter upon impact. And trackpads that formerly lifted you up slip under your fingertips. It's everything I wanted out of a final stage and had some incredibly tense moments near the end. But little did I know that there was so much more waiting under the surface. I mentioned B-sides, which can be unlocked by finding cassette tapes in the regular levels. And these show off slick remixes of the music tracks, which are fire by the way, as well as more challenging forms of the stages you've completed. However, unlike most games, Celeste continues to teach you new mechanics and abilities that were previously untouched here, such as being able to jump out of the end of the space blocks to gain more distance, or that you can attain a boost from a beholder by jumping near it when it responds, or my personal favorite, an upward wall dash that is utterly hard to pull off, but can give you exceptionally more height if you time it right. What's so cool about this is that they've always been available in the game, you just didn't know about them. So now, if you go through the original stages, you have even more mastery over the obstacles, and can find new or faster ways to best them. But indeed, it doesn't end there. After an incredible core B-side level that utilizes all previous mechanics at once, it unlocks C-sides, and while these are the true final challenges, they unbelievably continue to teach new techniques. Most notably, this downward dash boost, that without the knowledge of how to execute would make this area's puzzles seem impossible to complete. What I love about Celeste is all of the hidden capabilities just begging to be discovered, like how you regain a dash by exiting and re-entering a screen transition, or that you move faster in the air by holding down. These are remarkably useful for speedrunning, which I have to assume is the final goal the devs want the player to do after finishing all of its trials. But unlike most speedruns, these tools for mobility are not only intentionally left in the game, but explicitly taught to you by the game itself. So why does all of this matter? 
Certainly Celeste isn't the first game to show new elements and then build on them. In fact, it's very reminiscent of other platforming giants like Super Meat Boy, which also seem to have a never-ending supply of pain. But because of how much Celeste keeps going, long past anyone would expect it to, and reuses old methods in newer ways, it feels like it leaves no stone unturned, and that everything at your disposal had been used to its full potential. I never said to myself, oh man, I wish I saw more of that, or it would have been cool to see this this thing combined with that thing, because it actually did all of it. Plus, Celeste gets rewards right, by giving you more game to play when you best the tasks it places in front of you. And while I never used it, it has a robust assist mode that can turn off hazards or slow down game time, which I think is important so everyone can experience the amount of game they want to. And the way it's presented fully encompasses the narrative it's trying to tell. If the goal from the very start is to conquer our mountains, both physical and mental, the game needs to show you that you're capable of doing it, by encouraging you every step of the way, and making sure you're fully equipped to tackle the road that lies ahead, which is exactly what Celeste achieves so perfectly. If you've played Celeste, tell me why you've enjoyed it so much. Like I said, I've gotten a lot of requests to see an episode covering it, so I I'm curious. What were the parts that stuck out to you the most? Tell me in the comments below, and let's talk about it. I don't think I've ever had another game give me literal blisters on my thumbs, and yet I'm a little sad that now there isn't more to experience. And I think that's a surefire sign of a truly memorable adventure. Thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. I'll see you guys next time. Stay frosty, my friends. What makes a great sequel? Most would agree it takes expanding on the original ideas and establishing new mechanics, but without forgetting what made it so enjoyable in the first place. What's funny is that both video games and cinema follow almost the same structure when it comes to new installments. Often this includes raising the stakes of the initial conflict, broadening the scope of the story by introducing new characters, or maybe even fleshing out some of the existing ones to switch up the dynamic. Games have been doing this for years, and there's plenty of examples of phenomenal sequels that try out new concepts while still retaining their identity. Donkey Kong Country 2 comes to mind, with its ability to change the jolly romps through the forest of the original into its fully realized potential with creative new worlds, such as pirate ships, theme parks, and beehives, while also adding new mechanics like wind and transforming into animal buddies, as well as a focus on vertical level design, not just horizontal. The stakes are certainly higher. Instead of simply searching for a banana horde, this time you're out to rescue the hero from the last game, Donkey Kong himself. With the inclusion of Dixie, it makes both Kongs satisfying to play as, since they're both nimble and have unique abilities. Sorry, DK. Including the newly introduced Team Up Toss, to reach higher ledges and hidden secrets. Bosses are bigger and meaner than ever. And I've already talked about this at length, but the Lost World bonus stages being a reward for exploration are Mwah! It sets it a cut above. Portal 2 is another great example of taking the iconic idea of the original and amplifying it in new ways for a much more interesting experience. New characters like Wheatley and Cave Johnson are hilarious and full of personality, and turning GLaDOS into a pseudo-ally this time around was a great addition, since she was already so likable as a villain. Giving some backstory to Aperture Science and increasing the challenge by introducing gels and new ways to play felt like the perfect continuation of what was laid out in Portal 1 and a two-player co-op mode with its own story and set of hurdles to overcome was just a cherry on the lie. But perhaps the best example of a sequel, one that tends to come up in every debate on the topic, is Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, which is especially impressive considering how superb the original on the N64 was. As we outlined in our last video, Thousand Year Door would have a lot to live up to, but it took those elements that Paper Mario excelled at and took them even further, especially in the aesthetic and combat. While the first game pioneered the paper theming, it didn't utilize it too often, other than a visual gag here and there, or how the characters moved. Now, in Thousand Year Door, it becomes your upgrades, transforming into a paper airplane, turning sideways to fit through gaps, rolling up like a newspaper, and even becoming a cute little origami boat. Paper Mario means a lot more than just looks this time around, and the world you explore reflects that. 
Oh, and by the way, these new abilities are supposed to be seen as horrible curses that an evil spirit casts on you, but they're always helpful. You see, the humor and charm of the last game only continues here in your latest adventure. Thwomps wearing bow ties, mafia godfathers asking for favors, and bosses being afraid of cricket noises if you change your sound effects badge are par for the course here. I love that instead of just leaving Luigi bored at home, this time he's out on wild adventures and wants to tell you every detail. Every character is still so unique, and the atmosphere is just as playful as before, albeit in a bit more cartoony appearance. That being said, the story is certainly more intense than Bowser taking over Peach's castle. The x knots want to release an ancient demon to devour the world whole, and you'll travel literally to the moon and back to make sure that doesn't happen. In fact, it seems like all great sequels have a moon somewhere. Princess Peach sections make a return, but they've also added Bowser mini-quests in between chapters. And while I wouldn't say they're better than the 64 versions, it was the next logical step since Bowser isn't the big bad this time around. Rogueport, while not quite as memorable as Toad Town, has just as much to offer in the extra content department. From helping people in the trouble center, to a fully fledged casino, to the pit of a hundred trials for some added challenge. And unlike Paper Mario 64, you can head back to town after defeating the final boss. So the possibilities are endless. Heck, one of the side missions even nets you an optional party member, which is just fantastic. But I think the biggest overhaul was to the combat. They took that grade school production idea a step further by adding in a full studio audience to your battles. This means that if you perform well, more people will show up, but they also can throw things on the stage to damage or distract you. The stage itself will also start to fall apart and cause lights to fall from the rafters or backdrop scenery to collapse. On top of the action command system, they've also incorporated stylish points when you hit an additional button with the right timing. This, as well as having a full audience, will cause your star power meter to charge faster. Remember last time how I said that I wish the star spirits were better utilized in 64? Well now, the crystal stars, which are basically the same thing, not only have more appropriate uses, but they also are more engaging since you have to do a little mini game in order to use their full power. Of course badges make a return, but you also unlock natural maneuvers as you upgrade your shoes and hammer. So even if you don't equip a bunch of special attacks, there's still multiple ways to stack a ton of damage on your foes. Which is good because the bosses definitely have more health this time around as well. On top of all this, there's more varied button combos, a slot machine system to potentially refill all of your stats, and even partner health to worry about as you can switch the order that you attack. Battles are somehow even more enticing in Thousand Year Door than the nearly perfect system of the original, and that is one of the best feats the game accomplishes. Now, for everything this new adventure does right, I wouldn't say it's entirely flawless. Some of the characters are very similar to their predecessors, in both their personas and their abilities, and even a few of the chapters resemble each other a little too closely to really be considered new. That being said, where it does innovate, it does so in great ways. Like even though Koop still uses a shell toss maneuver, he can hold it in place, which allows for some cool puzzle solving opportunities. And although Key Hall Key begins with a loudmouth treasure hunter taking you to a secluded island, the fact that the boss of the chapter helps you duke it out with the x knots Pirates of the Caribbean style is insanely memorable. Really, for every deja vu moment Thousand Year Door has, there's another one that's totally fresh, like controlling an entire army of punies, or battling your way to the title fight against Rockhawk only to receive a fake crystal star on the championship belt, or getting your body taken over by a ghost until you're able to speak his name. The only true criticism I can make about the game is that there's a lot more backtracking. You'll often have to run back and forth across the entire area just to complete your mission. The worst culprit being Chapter 7, which requires you to travel to all the locations you visited just to find General White, who ends up being right where you started the entire time. Which brings me to an interesting point. What are common mistakes that we often see in bad sequels? While Banjo-Tooie does a lot of things well, like giving you all the abilities from the previous game right from the get-go, and then expanding on them even further, I do think it was a victim of its own massive scope. 
While the charm and charisma are still there, the world is a little too big for its own yellow britches. Not just in actual size, but also in objectives. Sometimes you'll have to carry out tasks all over the various stages just to get a single jiggy, and without compensating for a faster way to travel, what you're left with is a little bit too much spread out over a little bit too far of a tangled, messy adventure. What's ironic is that in Nuts and Bolts, they fixed the speedier traversal, but accidentally lost the core mechanics that made the original so beloved in the process. Other sequels are often scorned because they didn't change things enough. While it may be hard to stray from the winning formula a game has set, without innovating in interesting ways, players are left wondering why it wasn't just included as a new level pack in DLC. I remember hearing complaints about Hotline Miami 2, saying they changed things too much and they just wanted more of the original. But if it was simply more of the same, why would it need to be a standalone title? Without key improvements, people complain about how a series isn't going anywhere, or it's always just the same story over and over again. Look at the minimal differences of the first six Mega Man games, and then compare them to Mega Man X. Yes, they are technically sequels to the original, but I would argue that the X revitalization is a truly great example of one. And then sometimes you see a sequel that's simply too different to have a connection with its precursor. When you take a hard-as-nails, level-based action arcade game, and make it an open-world, convoluted collectathon, it's gonna raise some eyebrows. Why have fireballs and epic boss fights on a collapsing bridge when you could… pick up turnips? Look, at the end of the day, whether a sequel is good or bad is going to be subjective. But when in doubt, it's best to follow what other media does. Refine what was already established to create something new and engaging, while still paying homage to what made it so likable in the first place. What are some of your favorite video game sequels? What exactly did it do to expand on what the original laid out? Can you think of a game that you really wish had a sequel but doesn't? Tell me in the comments below and let's talk about it. Of course, the Paper Mario series doesn't end at Thousand Year Door, and it's hotly debated about how the rest of the franchise has handled our favorite RPGs. RPG. There's plenty to unpack about Super Paper Mario and Color Splash, but we'll have to talk about that next time. Until then, thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. I'll see you guys later. Stay frosty, my friends! Paper Mario means so much to so many different people. It practically defined my experience with an entire generation on the N64, and I know it was the same for many others on the GameCube with an unforgettable sequel. We've already talked at length about its charm, memorable characters, and satisfying gameplay, but we have one more era to discuss to wrap up our series on the Paper franchise. What happened after the first two games in Super Paper Mario and Color Splash. One is divisive, to say the least, while the other is essentially panned across the board, but I wanted to talk about my experience, since I basically played both of them fresh for this video. Do they hold a candle to the originals? Well, let's talk about it. First off, I know a lot of people are going to ask about Sticker Star, but I'm not covering this one for a couple reasons. One, I don't have a way to record 3DS footage, and two, from what I've seen, it has a very similar structure to Color Splash, so any criticisms I make would probably be the same for both games here. We'll basically kill two paper birds with one paper... rock. Rock, paper, scissors. But first we have to talk about Super Paper Mario, the black sheep of the family. Remember, Thousand Year Door was a nearly flawless sequel that expanded the original in unprecedented ways, so it already was going to be a tough act to follow. But you also have to keep in mind that Nintendo likes to switch things up with their new installments. Rarely do you see a follow-up that doesn't change the gameplay in any significant way. So the key difference they decided to run with this time was Mario's ability to change dimensions and go from a 2D perspective to 3D. Now, on its own, this is by no means a bad addition. In fact, it looks pretty cool from a marketing standpoint, and the potential was pretty high for where they could take it. But they removed a lot of the fundamental elements that the Paper Mario series had become known for along the way. The biggest turnoff for me and the most obvious shift was from a turn-based battle system to real-time combat. Things resemble Mario's older games a lot more this time around, jumping on enemies' heads and throwing objects to cause damage. But the physics aren't nearly as crisp as the Italian 
Battalion Wonder's other platformers. There's no more experience points or picking which stat you'd like to upgrade. Instead, you level up based on your total score, and it picks a predetermined stat to boost, taking away any agency you have on customizing your build. Badges are gone, upgraded equipment is nowhere to be found, and forget about party members while you're at it. Everything is streamlined toward jumping through obstacles and completing stages in this adventure. In fact, the second thing that rubbed me the wrong way at first was the four-act structure of each chapter. The fact that each level wraps up with a star block to hit feels anticlimactic, and much more linear than the exploration and traveling to different interconnected worlds of the first two games. Each set piece is accessed from the same location in the hub, and plays out like a level-based platformer. Sure, there's rising action and climax in each one, and of course more occurs than simply running to the right, but this new presentation style and massive gameplay shift was very jarring coming off the heels of Thousand Year Door, and the improvements it had made to the formula. When each chapter used to wrap up with a story summary of where Mario should head next, it was endearing and driving, but now, since it shows up after every section, it slows the pace way down and feels like we didn't even accomplish anything in between each activity. So my first hour or so with the game was spent more or less grumbling about how it was way too different from past Paper Mario games, and how annoyed I was at this new adaptation. But I gotta admit, after a while I got used to it, and the strengths really started to shine through. This game is fantastically written, just like the originals. Some of the new scenarios you face are amazing, like knocking over a priceless vase, and having to pay back the cost through hard manual labor, or taking a pit stop in the middle of space because your alien buddy really has to go, or my absolute favorite, infiltrating a nerd castle of an anime-loving, dating sim-playing, chameleon fanboy who steals your butterfly fly companion to take pictures of it. It's unbelievably wacky, catches you by surprise with some of the switch-ups, and feels like a good next step as far as the overall story of Paper Mario goes. The main villain is fascinating, and while there is certainly more dialogue this time around, I think it's just as creative as before, and kept me intrigued to see what happened next. Luigi becoming a brainwashed villain is a perfect twist that we really haven't seen before. There's a reason many claim Super has the best narrative of the entire series. But the coolest thing to me was the addition of new controllable characters. Like I said, Nintendo likes to try new things with its sequels, and this seemed like the logical progression for the series. Instead of just flipping dimensions with Mario, now you can float across gaps with Peach's umbrella, and even take control of King Koopa himself to pulverize baddies and destroy obstacles with your flame breath. Harkening back to the Super Mario RPG days, having Bowser on your side is always a good call in my book. Utilizing your arsenal of abilities combined with the powers of your various pixels is where Super Paper Mario shines best. It takes a little bit to take off, but around Chapter 3, the gameplay gains a very satisfying sense of flow, where you switch back and forth between all of your maneuvers to climb this massive tree, hitting blocks, blowing up walls, reaching far ledges, and burning up roots, all while checking different perspectives to make sure you didn't miss anything was just exhilarating. It's a little hit and miss with how often it will require your assortment of moves, but when it's at its best, I really enjoyed it. Unfortunately, it just doesn't reach that full potential, because of the other elements it scaled back so heavily. Having pixels you recover from chests is definitely a downgrade from party members with unique personalities and backstories. These guys only speak like once, and then they're just defined by the new gimmick it allows you to do. Using Peach and Bowser is great, but the menu is much more clunky this time around, mainly due to the limitations of the sideways Wii Remote. Having to open the full menu to swap pixels, characters, or use an item got old pretty quickly. And honestly, the whole game felt a lot more slow and cumbersome. Entering doors means you have to sit through this long spiral transition. Oh, guess I just gotta sit here and wait while it draws my mega power up. And why in the world can you skip the elevator cutscene everywhere else? But with this particular one, you can't. And maybe this is just a personal thing, but I really didn't like the design of the Flipside residents. They're rather odd and all look the same. Plus, they're the only race of people here. You know how past games would have visitors from other realms making a more cohesive environment? Well, everyone is segregated into their own worlds now. This caused Flipside in general to be uninteresting to explore, since there wasn't any distinguished features to set it apart, and condensing a massive town into a 2D viewpoint made it more annoying to navigate. 
As I said, the 3D perspective changes were a good concept, but the puzzles feel either really basic or so obtuse that you just get mad at the solution. Half the time you're holding right as an invincible 8-bit madman, running down empty corridors to collect keys, or simply turning the screen sideways to find the hidden door, and the other half you have to talk to a random NPC to know the arbitrary solution to a puzzle, or jump around looking for the way out until you remember that sometimes things are just invisible until you point at the screen with your controller. Some things are creative, but for the most part it feels like a dumbed down Mario adventure. I personally believe because of the level based structure and unwieldy execution of the controls and mechanics. I'll tell you what, here's what I would have done if I were to recreate Super Paper Mario to be a proper sequel to Thousand Year Door. First and foremost, ditch the four part installments of chapters, and make the stages accessible from different parts of the hub like the old games. No more of this eight doors atop the tower nonsense. A huge reason the first two games are admired so heavily for their integrated worlds was because of how you uncovered the next hidden chapter. Flipside has a lot of potential. You could still run around swapping dimensions and using new abilities, but hide the next locale behind some of these secret pathways. Keep the 3D perspective shift, I like this. But can we make the scenery a bit more appealing than just a lengthy barren hallway? Make these trees pop out. Put other obstacles in my way. I would get rid of the time limit on this ability and make it just as interactive as the regular view, instead of simply changing to it for a quick solution now and again. The pixel maneuvers are cool, but they really need to be full blown characters. You already have all these new species and villages, they don't even have to be Mario specific dudes. Make them aliens, cavemen, maybe even little chameleon henchmen that switch sides, I don't know. The pixels feel lazy and more like an item than a party member. And finally, but most important, the turn based combat has gotta come back. Now this was hard for me because Thousand Year Door amplified the original in so many cool ways. It would be really hard for Super to keep the train rolling. I racked my brain trying to think of how it could continue to innovate while still keeping the structure the same. And then it hit me. Use the 3D dimension swapping in the combat. Throughout the game, there's all of these pillars that have hidden notes on the side of them that you can only see from a certain angle. What if battles had that too? Like a boss who has his weakness written on his hand, but you can only read it if you turn sideways. There's already this annoying blooper fight where you can only damage it by attacking the red tentacle. What if you could see all of them at once, but identified the right one by seeing it from another direction? You could hide weak spots behind other objects, utilize different parts of the stage as a reward for looking around. Here's a crazy thought. What if Mario didn't have to be in battle at all times? What if he was just one of the characters you can switch out? So you could have any combination of Bowser, Peach, Luigi, your cool party members, and they all had useful abilities that would help you take down specific threats. Maybe Peach can reach attack points that no one else can. Bowser can be the tank that soaks up hits and deals out heavy damage, but is slow and only attacks once every other turn. Maybe even have enemies that adapt to how they can be damaged based on your attacks, like how others did back in the first games. If Mario is the only one who can change perspectives, perhaps they could award bonus experience for taking down baddies in a unique way, instead of brute forcing your way through. Look, I'm no game design expert, but the boss fights were easily the weakest part of the game for me, and I think making everything happen in real time turned it into a snooze fest. Each battle is super easy and normally has one way to kill them that either requires waiting for an open period to attack, or can be cheesed without using any brain power. They have all these special items to help in battle, but there's basically no point because you can just stomp through any situation. And the lack of experience or customization leaves you wondering why you're bothering fighting non-essential enemies at all. I don't think you'd have to carry over all the different mechanics from the originals, like stylish points or audience members affecting the battle, and I certainly don't believe it would have to be more of the same to be good either. Some people have said they just want another thousand year door adventure and they would be happy, but I really do empathize with the desire of wanting to stretch the genre and see what new heights they can reach. Flipping the perspective and having different playable characters was the right direction to go. I just think they strayed too far from what worked to be considered a classic. The foundation of a great Paper Mario game is there, but unfortunately it's buried under the muck of other design decisions. Color Splash on the other hand, oh boy, I think it's beyond saving. Which really sucks because, I mean just look at it. This is exactly what I would picture a Paper Mario game in HD to look like in today's day and age. It really is beautiful. If this latest entry on the Wii U has anything going for it, it's strong visuals and great writing. 
Jokes are top notch. It definitely has the humor that the series has become known for. And the different paper aesthetic changes the environment goes through are clever, reminding me of Kirby's Epic Yarn or Yoshi's Woolly World. And, uh... I guess smacking stuff with color was pretty alright too. Look, I'm sorry guys, I really tried to come up with more good things to say about it, but that's about all there is. I think there's two major problems that rob the rest of the experience from truly being enjoyable. And the first is probably the most common complaint people cite about this game. They took away any originality from the characters, and instead replaced them with generic toads. Toads everywhere! This is the most peculiar change I can think of for a Paper Mario game. The unique and interesting people you meet along your journey is exactly what sets the series apart from other titles. 64 had a town full of toads, but at least each one had a different look, name, and personality. The only thing separating these characters from one another is their color and the occasional scarf. They sort of use the fact that they all look the same as a joke here and there in the gameplay, but it's more than just toads. All the enemies you face are equally boring and cookie cutter in their appearance. Sucking the life out of paper beings seems like a shy guy thing to do. But where are all the other types of shy guys that we've seen before? They aren't even different colors. Goombas, Koopas, Cheep Cheeps. They're all based off the most common version of what you'll find if you Google image search their names. But the stripping doesn't stop there. Mario no longer has any form of party members, and the combat is scaled back to the most basic form I can think of. No experience, no badges, no leveling up and choosing your stat upgrades. Instead, now you have disposable co- Oh, sorry, I almost threw up there. Disposable co- Cards? What were they thinking? It's like they heard feedback from Super Paper Mario and said, Hey, the kids prefer turn-based combat instead of this real-time stuff. Let's do that, but nothing else. Take away anything appealing or worthwhile about it. They just want to take their turns now. There's so many problems with this system. The most blatant being that there's no good reason to even want to do these battles anymore. Without experience, the only real benefit you get from winning are these little hammer icons that increase your maximum paint store. But that isn't exactly helpful since you hardly run out of paint anyway, and you can just smack stuff in the environment to get more. So all that happens when you fight random baddies is you waste the one-time use cards in your deck, that you potentially will want to save until you need them on the required battles down the road. The cards themselves are mostly uninteresting, but the fact that they go away after putting them into play presents a bunch of new issues the game's never had before. There are these special thing cards that show off insane cutscenes and take out foes in funny ways, which I guess are kind of like the Power Star abilities from previous games, but instead of recharging over time, once you use them, they're gone, and the only way to get them back is to travel all the way to the docks of Port Prisma and buy them again, one at a time, mind you. Now, this is a bit more of a personal preference, but I also hate that you can't tell exactly how much health an enemy has. As you smack or jump on them, you can see their colors start to fade away, but you also can't tell how much damage your attacks do either. So it's basically a big guessing game. One time I might use more cards than needed to finish off a crowd of baddies, which sucks because you lose any card you've played even if it's not employed. But then the next time I'll be more conservative with the cards I use, and for some reason that enemy won't take nearly the same amount of damage, so I'll have to wait a whole extra round to finish the job. Knowing your adversary's stamina and the output you're capable of dealing is what made the original so strategy intensive. Planning three steps ahead or adjusting your actions based on how a boss reacts was thrilling. I've already talked about how the overall lower numbers and exact science made everything more manageable compared to other RPGs. Here, you start with 50 health, and I never really got below 30. It's way too easy and forgiving with health drops, and it feels like a crapshoot of whether your attacks will be enough to kill a particular guy or not. But this is all compounded by the worst aspect of the entire game. The fact that everything is so slow. Combat is just one of the many components plagued by snail-like pacing. To attack, you have to select your cards from a big ol' list of them. And sorting doesn't help because it puts your items on top for some reason, instead of, I don't know, your best abilities first. Then you have to paint them to power them up, then swipe up to wait a few more seconds, and finally begin your turn. Yes, there's action commands, but they're one of like three categories, and only involve pressing the A button at the right time. Combined with the fact that there's no reward, it just makes the prospect of any optional battle a huge hassle, and very annoying when you accidentally bump an enemy, or get jumped by an unavoidable goon. But it gets worse. 
Color Splash continues with the level-based stage layout, removing any semblance of a connected world, and after gathering a paint star, it boots you out of the area. This wouldn't be bad if there was only one collectible to find, but several times I found multiple stars that I wanted to grab. But nope, instead you have to go back into the level and traverse the annoying hallways of enemies again until you find the next star that's just sitting there ready to be taken. There's these bonus temples where you play rock, paper, scissors in a tournament bracket. You know, like the fastest game in existence. Nah, here you have to place your cards and watch it play out in slow motion apparently. And since it's mostly random, I guess you'd better get used to playing it over and over again if you want to conquer them. On their own, some of these decisions are excusable, but they combine together to make a story that drags way longer than it needs to. There's all these roadblocks that make even getting the first major paint star a pain to reach. Unlike previous games where you can find the first main collectible in an hour or two, this game goes out of its way to extend your playtime to agonizingly boring lengths. Forget many bosses or unique locations, it'll take hours to go through bland fields and the same waves of enemies before you have to find the special key toads to unlock this gate and then get stomped by the first major boss because you didn't have the one particular item required to beat him. So you have to go through the entire castle again after getting the right power up and then you get the first star. Woo! Maybe it's because I played all of these Paper Mario games back to back, but I could not be bothered to keep playing. I'm sorry, but I, I just couldn't. I would love to come up with some sort of way to rescue this game, cite my own version that would have fixed it and made it a worthy successor, but it's too far gone. They would have to scale back every single element except the core maneuver of painting the environment. Start from there, keep the wacky arts and crafts spectacles, but change everything else. There's a lot of speculation about why this happened conversations behind closed doors with Shigeru Miyamoto, and the development team being forced to use more basic characters, blah blah blah. But one thing is surely clear, this is not Paper Mario, at least not what I've come to know the series to be. This is a totally different game, and one that may have actually done okay if it didn't have such a prestigious title attached to it. It's funny, there's a lot of things I don't like about Super Paper Mario, but its strengths really become apparent when you see a version where they're all missing. At least it was unique in story, locations, characters. They couldn't even be bothered to come up with a new paint monster as the main villain. It's just back to basic Bowser. Without a doubt, nostalgia is a powerful thing. Even after hearing all the negativity concerning Color Splash, I still got excited when I ordered a copy for this video, thinking there would still be some semblance of what I loved in there somewhere. The series means a lot to me, and I fear that it will only be in memory if the recent titles are anything to go off of. But. Who knows? We've seen some crazy spiritual successors fill a void that fans have been yearning for. In fact, in the process of writing this script, an indie game called Underhero came onto my radar, which cited Paper Mario as one of its major inspirations. It has a lot of cleverness and charm in its story since you play as a bad guy instead of the typical hero. But the best part is its twist on battle mechanics. You dodge and attack very similar to the action command system, but everything happens in real time. You have have a stamina meter that refills as you successfully avoid incoming damage. So while you can just spam the attack button, you have to balance it with being winded and vulnerable. It even deals a critical hit if you pull off a groovy shot. But since it's not turn-based, this occurs when you swing to the beat of the background music. You learn different enemy patterns as you progress, but you can also bribe them to avoid battle altogether, or talk to them before you duke it out to gain information. And I don't know, there's just something super satisfying about seeing that beautiful level up screen again. While it's not exactly like Paper Mario's system, it is similar to the series just in how engaging and unique it is. I highly recommend checking it out if you've been craving a fix like the classics. Now certainly, there is a dedicated fanbase that swears by Super Paper Mario's quality. And hey, maybe there was some stuff I didn't get to in Color Splash that picks up the pace. I want to hear from you. What are some of your favorite things about either of these games? What do they have that the other entries were lacking? Or if you think they weren't as good, tell me your own versions of how you would improve them. Get creative with it, write them out in the comments below, and let's talk about it. Thanks for watching another episode of Bad Game Design. Remember that the goal here is not to bash a title that some people hold dear, it's to talk about how they could be better, so that hopefully we'll see even more innovation from games yet to come. I'll see you guys next time. Stay frosty, my friends. I've always been a big music guy, but you may not realize that based on the good game design series. 
We do talk about music, but normally as a passing thought or a quick nod to how good a soundtrack is. But when you think about it, music and sound effects are some of the most important tools in a game designer's arsenal. It can set the mood, encourage you to push onward, or even be used as a gameplay mechanic itself. So today, we'll dedicate an entire video to the topic, and look at all the ways music can help or hinder a player's experience. Let's talk about it. The first main thing music has the power to do, at least on a macro level, is establish the atmosphere of the game you're playing. But this is so much more than picking a slow or fast song. You have to consider what instrumentation will be used, the structure, and what emotion you want the player to feel. The beauty of music is that it can be so diverse, and a good developer uses that to their advantage. Hotline Miami is a high-octane 80s killing spree, just oozing with juice. So the soundtrack reflects that. Lots of synths and electronic dance music that you might hear in a club from that time frame. But a bit more intense. It sounds like something straight out of John Wick. Stardew Valley, on the other hand, is a master class in fitting the theme of the current season you're in. Spring is all about new beginnings and endless possibilities, while summer is bombastic, fun, and feels like you're in a hoedown. But when winter hits, there's nothing but calm, quiet xylophone to keep you company as you try to survive the harsh climate. But all of the tracks in this game are relaxed and charming, which really describes the package as a whole. Banjo-Kazooie is fascinating because this is when you start to see composers thinking about much more than a singular focus for a song. Listen to Grant Kirkhope describe the overall theming of this dynamic duo. This is only like 12 notes, isn't this? You know, if you count this C, C sharp, D, D, you know, between C and C octaves, right? And the middle, and the middle point of, a, of, a, of the two, between the two Cs is an F sharp. It's, and it's, it used to be called the Devil's Interval or the Tritone. So I figured that because Banjo-Kazooie were complete opposite characters, i.e. up because he's clever and sarcastic, banjo's dumb and you know, etc. C and F sharp are the furthest notes apart. It's the furthest point from C and C, right? So I figured that's why it's got the chords are C major, F sharp major, C major, F sharp major. That's, and that's why it works. That's why all the, all the music in banjo is basically based on that interval because it represents, in my mind, the, the two opposite characters. But that was so in addition to creating spooky tunes for a Haunted Mansion stage, or using an Egyptian-sounding scale in Gobi's Valley, he also makes sure that the dichotomy of Banjo and Kazooie is present in every piece he writes, by including those dissonant notes. Sometimes it's not about specific lines or melodies, but setting a tone through ambience. Super Metroid starts out eerily quiet and somber, but as you journey deeper into Planet Zebus, it comes alive slowly fading into Brinstar and showing you through music that there is eminent danger here, like you walked into a monster party that you weren't invited to. Then when you loop back through the first area after growing stronger, you're greeted with a heroic theme that completely shifts the mood. Instead of being hesitant and scared, now you're a confident, capable bounty hunter. Genius. You see music setting the atmosphere of a game all over the place, and it's often as simple as looking at the source material. Guacamelee uses mariachi-style acoustic guitars, Cuphead evokes the big band era of classic cartoons, and Shovel Knight gives loving homage to the 8-bit games it was inspired by. Heck, what if a game doesn't have any background music at all, but solely relies on its sound design to build meaningful moments? Look no further than Thumper, where you get to be the one creating music through your actions. The loud clanging of metal is used in repetitive ways to make recognizable beats, but is more engaging since each maneuver you complete is tied to a catchy sound effect. As I said earlier, it's important to ask what emotions you want the player to feel while they go through the experience. Compare a game like Fury, using heart-pounding metal as you take on incredibly challenging bosses, to something like Yoshi's Woolly World, which employs joyful, soothing tunes to carry you through each stage on a pillow of happiness. And if you don't think this type of selection is important, just imagine if these two games had swapped soundtracks. Now, more on the micro side of things, music can also be used to inform the player about the current situation they find themselves in. David Wise is an expert at using samples from the setting of a stage to give more life to his compositions, like chirping crickets in the forest, bubbling lava in volcanoes, or even screams from children in an amusement park. The wind is a backdrop while you're flying high on a ship's mast, and this driving scale used while navigating a dangerous hive sounds like bees buzzing all around you. It not only creates a catchy melody, but makes the world feel rich and real. 
The Messenger adds a neat little muffle filter to the music when you go underwater, which is a nice touch. But if you're willing to put in more effort, a fully recomposed version of a track makes a big difference. Like when you enter a dank cavern in Banjo-Kazooie, or hear a chilled out version of the main theme on the pause menu. Man, Grant really is the best at sweet pause themes, isn't he? But something that The Messenger really did do well was program the game to completely swap between 8-bit and 16-bit versions of the songs and sound effects whenever you jump through a time portal. It really feels like you're playing two separate games at once. Portal 2 is normally devoid of music, but will use intriguing sound effects when you gain momentum on gels, or even play simple notes when you connect a laser, which adds character to the situation, but also helps guide you toward a puzzle solution through sound alone. Paper Mario does this cool thing where once you enter Chapter 4 and the Shy Guys are running amok around Toad Town, it plays a remixed version of the theme with these extra tinkering noises and clanging of children's toys to show you that while you're in the same place, mischief is afoot here. In fact, lots of Mario games like to layer in extra sounds when you change up the gameplay, like how hopping on Yoshi adds extra percussion in Super Mario World. Sometimes a big reveal requires a big crescendo in the music to really drive home the impact. Like in God of War, where a powerful choir chant is used sparingly but effectively at just the right moments. Music can also help with a certain flow the game is going for. In Spider-Man, it plays an epic rendition of the Avengers theme while you're swinging around town. But when you stop, the music stops. And when you begin again, it picks right back up with you to continue the momentum. If a game requires you to retry a stage many times in quick succession, like The End Is Nigh or Wings of V, it's a good idea to have the track continue playing despite the resets, which is another way to help give the player a sense of flow. You realize how jarring it is when this type of thing is not present. Finally, in addition to setting the atmosphere or building off the current situation, there's also a ton of other really cool things music can do in gaming. Wander Song is an unbelievably adorable adventure of a bard that tries to save the world with his voice alone. He never uses violence and sings his way through a bevy of creative obstacles. He even belts out his responses to questions, which is just hilarious. But while the voice wheel mechanic never changes, they made sure to swap the key of the notes so that they're in tune with the different background music throughout the game, which is a detail only some will notice, but goes a long way toward polish. It is a game entirely about music after all, so I would only expect as much. Everything is bright and happy, which fits the main character's personality perfectly, and some of the most impactful moments are driven home due to an equally impactful chorus. Another thing to consider is when a particular track is going to be used quite often, like battle themes and RPGs for example, you want to make sure they're really catchy and won't get annoying to listen to over and over, since the player will probably hear it hundreds of times during a playthrough. I'm always impressed when a composer is able to come up with an anthem that never gets old no matter how many times I hear it. That takes some real talent right there. And hey, if you want to go for bonus points, try out what Octopath Traveler did by adding in nods to the particular character you're playing and using their theme as it transitions into boss battles. You'll have to earn the right! I will not fail. No! What? Let's get this over with. All right. This is an insane amount of work, but really blends the different paths together into one cohesive experience. In fact, let's talk about motifs, because they probably pop up more often than you would originally think. This is when you take a specific melody or part of a song and bring it back later on to emphasize a point. Sometimes this can be a simple character theme that plays whenever they pop up on screen, but it can be more than that too. Ori in the Blind Forest has a beautifully memorable main ballad, but it shows up continuously throughout the adventure, often at very important or pivotal moments in the story. Gamescore Fanfare has an amazing video you need to check out on Uncharted 4's use of motif, and how it complements the back and forth relationship between Nathan and Elena. When you recontextualize the same notes in a different situation, it leaves a lasting impression on your brain, even if it's on a subconscious level, and in my opinion is what can elevate a good soundtrack to a phenomenal one. One final thing to consider when implementing music into your game is if it'll coincide with the gameplay. 
Now, I'm not just talking about rhythm games, though they obviously have their place as well. Sometimes titles will combine this with another genre, like Crypt of the Necrodancer, which is a dungeon crawling roguelite, but you also move to the beat of the song. This makes it a sort of real-time strategy game, in addition to the randomly generated exploration. And a really cool natural byproduct is that the difficulty rises simply by having a faster song, so the player has to think more quickly about where to move next. But music can be more integral with the gameplay in smaller ways too. Like in Underhero, how attacking in rhythm will give you a damage boost. Or even just having elements in the background reacting along to the music. I'm a sucker for any stage that has obstacles bouncing around in step with the song. I mean, come on, you're gonna tell me these Koopas dancing to the beat isn't adorable? Get out of here. If there's one thing to remember about music in video games, it's that it can be so much more than background noise. Many, many games have passable soundtracks that get the job done, but don't have any meaningful impact on the experience. When designing a game, I think it's important to think about all the aspects, not just the gameplay or visuals, and how they can all complement each other to make something memorable. The difference between a good song and a great song is one that has connection. Why does this particular piece fit better than any other? Is there something missing that could help nail the emotion we're going for? How can I better show the player what I'm trying to show them? All the different pieces are in play at the same time whether you like it or not, so make sure they're in harmony. What are some of your favorite video game soundtracks and why? What about specific parts of a game where the music or sound effects made a greater impact than if they weren't there? Tell me in the comments below and let's talk about it. Thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. I'll see you guys next time. Stay frosty, my friends. The 90s gave birth to 3D gaming, and with it came a new genre we lovingly refer to as collectathons. These quickly became some of my favorite titles. There's something about gathering all the various items and collectibles in a world that gave me such a satisfying feeling. And now, with a few modern examples expanding the formula even further, I wanted to discuss what exactly makes these collectathon games so fun to play. And what's the X factor that makes a great one truly stand out amongst the rest? Let's talk about it. First of all, I think we have to determine what defines a collectathon. There are a lot of 3D platformers out there, but only some are focused on collecting multiple things throughout the numerous levels. So for this discussion, I'm going to narrow our list to games that have more than one collectible that's recorded in a pause menu. Jiggies, Notes, and Extra Honeycombs, for example. Not just Power Stars. While certain games obviously blaze the trail for this genre, I want to make sure we're analyzing the marathon aspect of these games specifically. Because of the shift in focus and many hours you pour into them, there's a natural inclination toward fatigue with collectathons, but they implement little mile markers along the way to keep you pushing through that exhaustion, which is a major aspect of what sets them apart from other platformers. Also, there are plenty of titles that I haven't played, so don't be sad if I don't mention every one of them, okay? So what are the iconic features that make games like Banjo-Kazooie and Spyro widely loved, and games like Donkey Kong 64 and Ukulele largely disliked? Let's start with the most obvious, map size and layout. If you enjoy collecting, you'd think that adding more and more would be a good thing. But bigger is not always better when it comes to open explorable worlds. Not only can they be overwhelming to a player the first time they see them, but also annoying or confusing to navigate depending on a few other aspects. Having recognizable landmarks and proper level design ensures that you won't get lost, and can easily find new areas you haven't spotted yet. Something I kept noticing about Ukulele is that all the structures and buildings look the same, making it really hard to discern where I'd already explored. Not to mention, very uninteresting interesting to look at. Compare that to, say, Bubble Gloop Swamp, where right as you enter the main area of the stage, pillars of huts are straight ahead, to your left is a scary crocodile head, and to your right you see this giant turtle that screams when you heard it. Each location feels like a ride at an amusement park. You want to see what kind of fun is waiting around the corner. Banjo-Kazooie was incredible at this stuff. Each section of a stage was defined by their memorable landmarks. Pirate ship, crab, sandcastle, lighthouse, snowman, Christmas tree, cabins, walrus. Now, to be fair, no game gets it right 100% of the time. Gobi's Valley has a ton of pyramids that all look the same, and levels with a lot of tiny, samey rooms can get repetitive, like Rusty Bucket Bay. But again, this is where the size of a stage can help or 
hinder the experience. For every tedious task in a smaller game, that problem tends to be amplified in their larger siblings. As a rule of thumb, I like to think that if your level requires warp pads to get around effectively, it might be too big. Not because they're inherently bad themselves, but because it means there isn't an efficient way to get around without them. Now, of course, I caught myself in a lie there, because Super Mario Odyssey is guilty of exactly this. Huge stages with lots of moving parts and checkpoint markers if you need them. So what exactly makes that an okay example versus, say, Banjo-Tooie? Well, in my opinion, it's what many people thought was a negative of the game. There's collectibles everywhere. Tons and tons of moons are littered all throughout these stages, as well as purple coins and many other goodies. It's sort of the same principle as Breath of the Wild. In order to guarantee you're always finding something new within a short proximity, there needed to be a megaload of items spread across the land. This is where ukulele tends to drop the ball. It's got the giant worlds, but not a lot to do in them. Donkey Kong 64, on the other hand, has giant levels as well as a crap ton of collectibles, but what it lacks is the next major component of a good collectathon fast and engaging movement. If a game gives you options to clear stages quickly and interestingly, it already feels much better than one with clunky or slow controls. This is why A Hat in Time and Mario Odyssey's larger stages don't feel cumbersome, but Yuka and DK64 do, and the size of the environments only hurt this principle as well. The Talon Trot feels super speedy in Banjo-Kazooie, but it doesn't get you nearly as far in the massive worlds of Tui. Jack and Daxter doesn't have particularly versatile movement, but its smaller worlds make it more manageable. I think the series that hit it just right is Spyro the Dragon. You can move as fast as you want with the dash ability, and the levels are pretty tiny, meaning you can complete them in around 15 to 20 minutes. There's something really satisfying about not just collecting all the goodies, but doing it quickly and efficiently. Essentially, while a collectathon is all about discovery and searching the nooks and crannies, one that doesn't respect your time can become a pain. This is why backtracking with new abilities, while dynamic in theory, can spiral into a wild goose chase that's not worth starting if left unchecked. Banjo-Kazooie has one instance where you'll need a power-up from a previous level to get a jiggy. Either the running shoes to beat Boggy, or the beak bomb to open certain pyramids. Whichever you play first. But in Tui, not only are the stages massive and unchanging in appearance, but it'll make you run all over the entire game before you're able to get what feels like half of the main collectible. Opening shortcuts, gaining late-game abilities, and talking to NPCs everywhere. So that by the time I hit Pterodactyl Land, it got too boring for me upon on a replay. So that covers the stages, importance of size, and speed of playability. But what about the collectibles themselves? It probably doesn't matter where they're put, right? The players will find them eventually. The whole point of the game is to search and find them. Well, not necessarily. The beauty of having so many things to collect is that they can be used to guide players through the levels. The best collectathons I've seen litter them as breadcrumbs toward various activities and secrets, which not only helps to find the main path if the player gets lost, but can also mark an area that hasn't been explored yet. If you follow the coins, you're bound to find something new. If they're placed at random or as decoration, it's a missed opportunity for some clever level design. Now, a Banjo-Tooie still had notes, but condensed them into sets of 5 and 20. And while they still are used along the major walkways, there's simply much less of them to work with in terms of laying out the intended paths. Which is a shame, considering how much larger the worlds are this time around. DK64 definitely crams all kinds of goodies in just about every spot imaginable, but has the unfortunate element of not being able to collect them if you're a different Kong, which leads to many monotonous trips back to the tag barrel in order to gather everything. When done right, collectibles can essentially be your tour guide along the route of exploring the stage, and make sure you learn where things are in relation to one another, while easily moving on to the next major attraction. Finally, it's nice when each of the various collectibles have their own intended purpose. Some games end up being redundant, whether intentionally or not. Like in Jack and Daxter. Yes, the precursor orbs help to guide you, but their only real purpose is to trade them in for power cells with the villagers. And the scout flies are more like the red coins in Mario 64. All of it boils down to the one major roadblock, needing power cells to proceed. This isn't always a bad thing, but look at how Spyro 2 handles it. You need talismans from each stage to move on to the next area, you use gems to unlock new pathways with money bags, and in the third world you need a certain amount of green orbs to open the final boss. 
Each goodie has its own reason for being there. Other than, you know, something shiny to find and feel good about. Banjo-Kazooie uses puzzle pieces to open stages, notes to unlock doors, and extra honeycombs to increase your health. DK64 has banana boss doors, golden keys, coins for the shop, be locker in your way. Whew, yeah, that's a lot of stuff. But even better is when there's special rewards for completing the game 100%. Again, Jack and Daxter falls a little flat here. It teases you with a door that needs all 101 power cells to open, but when you do, it leaves you with a cliffhanger. Bummer, dude. But this begs an important question. What should a good completion bonus be? Sometimes games will give you a benefit after completing everything there is to do, so there's not much purpose to the reward. It should be something that's enjoyable and useful, but maybe also include lower tiers of bonuses along the way. Spyro 1 unlocks a final celebratory level at 100%, but Spyro 2 opens a theme park to play minigames at a smaller fraction of all the collectibles, in addition to that total reward. Even Mario Odyssey doesn't have the best completion bonus out there, but to be fair, the best stuff is unlocked at particular intervals of 250 and 500 moons. I don't think Nintendo expected most players to actually gather everything, again showing that there's so many moons to collect all over the place, but you don't have to bend over backward to see the grand finale. Banjo-Kazooie really gets it right here. After finding every Jiggy, you double your maximum health, which makes the brutal Grunty fight so much easier, as well as egg and feather stockpiles for when you run out by getting all the notes. That being said, the minimum requirement to beat the game is probably a little high, at 94 Jiggies and 810 notes. Ouch. My point here is that no game does it perfectly, and I think many of them learned from each other along the way. But at the end of the day, the ones that were most satisfying to me were ones that didn't overdo it with their scale, allowed for speedy movement, and used the collectibles in clever ways to guide the player and reward them for their accomplishments. While everyone will enjoy something differently, these were what stuck out to me while reflecting on one of my favorite genres. What about you? What are the best collectathon games you've played, and why? What elements did they emphasize, and why was it such such an enthralling experience for you. Tell me in the comments below and let's talk about it. I genuinely hope we'll see more collectathons in the years to come, because I've loved the innovation developers have come up with recently, and I think game design can only get better from here. Thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. I'll see you next time. Stay frosty, my friends. Holy crap, you guys really came through with the suggestions of tactics games to try out. I've been playing a ton of them over the last several weeks. And you know the coolest part about discovering a new genre that you love? Instead of playing a 10 out of 10 game like once every couple years, I get to experience the best of the best all at once. It's like Christmas up in here. So yes, I'm still a newbie to everything strategy games have to offer, but I've already noticed loads of fantastic game design that I just have to talk about. So let's dive right in. What struck me right away about this vast sea of tactics games is how diverse they can be. And I'm not just talking about setting, story, or tone. Even in gameplay and mechanics, it seems like no two experiences are alike. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're all turn-based, and you can only move a certain number of spaces to take down your enemy, but how they bend within those rules is pretty captivating. Advance Wars has a health system, where the more damage you take, the less you're able to dish out. But you'll always hit your opponent if you attempt to. Compare this to, say, XCOM Enemy Unknown, where they incorporate hiding behind cover to lower the percentage chance of getting hit at all. But this reciprocates to your foes as well, making you realize that each battle is more about positioning than actual brute force. The annoying thing here is that if an enemy has even just one HP left, they'll still do full damage on their turn. Then you have games like Fire Emblem, which add permadeath to the equation, so you have to think about much more than the current battle. If someone dies early on, you're stuck with a smaller team for the rest of the journey. This leads to decisions that are more calculated and less risky. Maybe I'll hang back an extra turn and heal just to be safe. On top of this, you have roguelites like Invisible Ink and Into the Breach, which have to somehow account for all the procedurally generated obstacles that'll stand in your way. Pit People wants you to plan your entire turn at once instead of one action at a time. Steam World Heist is a 2D side-scroller. Final Fantasy Tactics throws in a directional facing system, where you'll have a harder time landing a hit if you attack from the front. The list goes on and on. But what blew me away is that all of these titles make sure their variables are balanced, and they achieve this through many different methods. 
For example, while I personally prefer games without any randomness to account for, the ones that do have them minimize the potential frustration by allowing the player to move greater distances. In Mario Rabbids Kingdom Battle, you can team jump to reach those far away baddies, or use a slide maneuver to deal out extra damage if you happen to be a bit closer. But normally, to ensure a 100% hit on an enemy, you often leave yourself exposed in the process. This is why setting up your squad with extra defense bubbles, or remote control drones to do the dirty work for you are really cool alternatives. Of course, allowing for faster travel has to be carefully considered. As a designer, you don't want the characters to be unstoppable either. This is why some games establish a two-tiered movement system, and only let you attack if you're within the first one. Invisible Ink takes a very different approach. Here, stealth is the key to survival. On paper, this one looks really brutal because if you get spotted even once, your teammate is immobilized, which usually means your run's about to go belly up. But ah, see, they've ensured you have several rewind charges that set you back to the start of a previous turn, just in case you make a silly, life-threatening mistake. Compare that to Advance Wars, where each individual unit doesn't have that much impact on the overall course of battle. So if you realize you messed up and there was a better course of action, as they say, a too bad, so sad, but they make up for that by letting you buy more units to replace the ones you've lost. And the more structures you control, the more money you receive each turn. Your mind is more on the scale of an army taking over the whole battlefield, and less about each specific maneuver. One tactics game that I found especially intriguing was Into the Breach. Because of the smaller scale, it's able to focus on countless moving parts working hand in hand. Every single turn in this game is like its own logic puzzle, where you have to account for each possible outcome. Is this enemy lobbing an attack or shooting in a straight line? If I hit it, will it launch into the civilians next door? What's the order of operations? Will this guy die before he has a chance to hurt me? You're only allowed one reset for the entire encounter, so you need to plan carefully, but it's also extremely clear about what the consequences of your actions will be. As you unlock new team combinations, it might seem like some of them are underpowered because they don't do any damage outright. But you realize environmental effects are just as important as sheer power. Like how smoke cancels the next enemy attack, or fire kills them slowly over a couple turns. Because the goal is to simply survive and not take building damage, maybe moving an enemy one square away is the best course of action, instead of trying to tank your way through. In fact, the way you do purchase new squads is by completing achievements, which directly encourage you to experiment with the game's various systems. It actively wants you to see how deep the rabbit hole goes. Ugh, this game is so stinking good. A few other things I've noticed modern iterations improve upon is speed of play and accessibility. As great as some of the classics are, they can be a little slow to get through. And I mean, it's no secret that a level in a tactics game is generally much longer than one in a platformer. That's why it's really cool that games like Wargroove allow you to remove battle animations, or hold right click to speed up enemy movement. It's always nice when you can get back to the action as fast as you'd like. But further, making sure they're accommodating for all different levels of play is a huge plus in my book. Wargroove's difficulty sliders and Mario Rabbids health boosts are great optional choices for those needing extra help, and are better than picking easy, medium, or hard before you even know what that looks like in practice yet. Sometimes you'll see rookie mistakes only affecting your score or ranking instead of restricting progress. Or sometimes, like in Invisible Ink, rather than failing a mission after a certain amount of turns, the game simply cranks up the challenge the longer you stay in a level. So it pushes you toward efficiency without overwhelming you, or making you restart altogether. Now, this goes both ways too. Added challenge for those wanting more is also a good idea. Obviously, you can just change the difficulty or give a higher score for playing well, but I really like when there are harder bonus objectives or other ways to modify how you play for veterans seeking to push their limits. Hilariously, the first time I played Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, I accidentally started the first mission without realizing you could place more units on your team, so I got totally creamed since I only had two characters. But I realize this is a neat, though possibly unintentional way to increase the difficulty. You could do challenge runs by limiting your units, or restricting which abilities you can use. 
The bottom line is that the best tactics games I've seen make you feel clever by figuring out a solution that wasn't explicitly handed to you on a silver platter. And this is accomplished not by lack of instruction, but by giving an abundance of options to succeed. This means that yes, having a variety of classes, locations, and enemy types all with different attributes is great, but it's more about how they interact with each other. So maybe this means in addition to making sure your weapon is strong against the enemies, you move to more difficult terrain as well to lessen their chance of hitting you back. In the Rabid Kong boss fight, he regains health from his horde of bananas, until you press the button to drop them into the depths below. But in doing so, you'll get pummeled by a retaliation attack. So maybe the drone can be more useful than just fighting from a distance. You could move it onto the button to save yourself some unwanted damage. The best strategy in Into the Breach seems to be blocking enemy spawns by standing on top of them. You only lose 1 HP and then never have to deal with it. But even better, if you can move your opponent onto one of those spaces, not only will it block incoming spawns, but hurt that ugly alien bug as well. Yeah, a two for one special. Or sure, you could simply push a foe out of range from attacking a building, but instead you could teleport it over some water and drown it immediately. This stuff is genius. The obvious choice isn't always the best one, and finding that sweet spot of a perfect play, man, there's nothing like it. But you see, I think they're designed that way on purpose. By having a ton of choices, you open the doors for creativity to shine. The tricky part is making sure that everything is balanced, and a particular strategy isn't overpowered to win every time. Some games include tide turning special abilities, but put them on a cooldown, or can only be used once per battle. Others give these skills to important characters that must stay alive in order to be victorious, so you may keep them further behind despite their potential on the front lines. Either way, tactics games thrive by making you think before every action. And because of their slower nature and higher punishment for mistakes, you feel rewarded when you figure out the optimal solution to whatever is thrown your way. Have you ever had those aha moments while playing tactics games? Tell me about your favorite ones and why they stuck with you. What is it about these titles that give you an experience unlike any other genre? Tell me in the comments below and let's talk about it. I have been having the time of my life playing through these games, and I can't wait to see where they'll go next. If there's other genres you'd like a video on that I don't normally cover, be sure to let me know as well, because if they're anything like the broadened horizons tactics games have shown me, I'm all in. Thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. I'll see you guys next time. Stay frosty, my friends. Oh, hey, sorry guys, give me one second. I gotta reach the level of chocolate chip sensei. Okay, and we're good. Whenever I think of clicker or sometimes called idle or incremental games, I get really confused. They're essentially the most bare bones experiences when it comes to actual gameplay. You just click numbers to watch those numbers go up and then wait for other numbers to increase so you can click more numbers. So why in the world are these games so addictive? I've seen countless people, myself included, get sucked into the same trap time and time again. Why do we keep playing them knowing they're so inherently shallow? Let's talk about it. Ooh, golden cookie. In case you've never played a clicker game, they're called that for a reason. Your only mechanic is to click things on screen, and you'll be doing it a lot. Most all of these titles follow the same structure. You start out with nothing and need to click your way to the first upgrade, which will automatically start clicking for you. And you build from there until you have an army of enhancements, so you don't have to click at all to gain resources. These increase in power, but also jump exponentially in cost the further you get. So eventually this leads to major progress walls, where you'll have to wait for your currency to get high enough to purchase the next upgrade. This is where the moniker Idle Games came in. The longer you play, the more you'll have to wait. So many people just let them run in the background while they do other things, until they can play again and then repeat ad nauseum. Now, many clicker games get around this becoming boring by introducing a prestige system that allows you to completely reset your progress to the beginning but with a permanent buff to your click power, so you can get back to your original state much faster and beyond to higher heights from there. On top of this, several games include little bonus clickables that appear on screen for a limited time, which allow you to have an extra boost to your productions, while others keep collecting even when the game is turned off. So if you go to bed and come back in the morning, you'll have a nice pool of money to spend. Either way, this system has drawn in huge audiences that keep coming back day after day to watch numbers rise, with no other purpose than that alone. 
and nowadays it spawned countless wikis and thousands of different iterations. Complete with memes and terrible art assets galore. Who puts corn on pizza? How did something that started as a joke to make fun of grindy game mechanics turn into an industry behemoth that's so alluring? What caused me to drop over 60 hours into Adventure Capitalist without even realizing it? It just doesn't logically add up. Well, we're about to get scientific up in here. Strap in, snow babies. There's a few different psychological elements going on in clicker games, but let's start with the most obvious. We as humans love reaching goals. If there's something you've been working toward, it feels good when you finally achieve it. And at an even more basic level, we just like watching numbers go up. They did experiments on animals in these things called operant conditioning chambers, or Skinner boxes named after their creator, to see if giving a piece of food would encourage the animals to keep doing a desired repetitive action, or in some cases punish them for not doing so. And wouldn't you know it, of course they kept doing the random simple task, because they got a treat out of it. In gaming, we see this all the time. Besides obvious comparisons like slot machines or loot boxes, this is also why achievements are so effective. It feels good to be rewarded for your actions. And instead of only getting that feeling of satisfaction when beating a game, this is taken to the extreme in incremental games, because you gain achievements all the time. In fact, it seems to be what the entire system is based on. So if you don't feel like you're accomplishing much in your real life, whether you're just bored or simply going through the motions, you can boot up an idle game and feel rewarded over and over again, and with very little effort needed. Progress feels good, even if it's in a silly video game. But in addition to this, you're dealing with our need for closure, and something called the Zigarnik Effect. Coined by a psychologist named Bluma Zigarnik, but you can just call her Miss Z for short. She basically found through her research that people remember incomplete tasks better than ones we've completed. And I'm sure you can attest that this is true. I can't tell you how many games I've beaten, but I can definitely remember the ones that I haven't. The games that bested me stick out like a sore thumb in my brain that desires order. We want goals and tasks to be completed, so when they aren't, we'll put in the effort to finish them. This is why you see people like The Completionist, or those satisfied when they get another platinum trophy. There's a sense of relief when you achieve your goals. So with all that considered, are clicker games really all that bad? Is it hurting anyone to have games that focus on those aspects of our brain? Well, from a game design perspective, I would argue that yes, it is, and for two major reasons. One, there is no ending to these games, and two, it uses real time as a mechanic. Let's break it down a little bit. So yes, while you can complete various tasks throughout your playthrough of an idle game, without an actual win state or end in sight, there will always be this sense of lingering desire to play more. It'll never go away because there is no final accomplishment. You can see everything the game has to offer, but your numbers will keep going up until they simply don't mean anything anymore. Eventually, it feels like the only reason you'll keep playing is because of the sunk cost fallacy, where you'll tell yourself, I've already spent so much time building up my stats, it would be a waste if I quit now. And even if you reset with an added prestige bonus, that feeling of satisfaction will quickly become more and more fleeting, as you realize the entire experience is ultimately pointless. But even from a more tangible design aspect, it's my opinion that using real time to drive your progress is a manipulative practice. The hilariously ironic thing about idle games is that the best way to play them is to actually not play them at all. If you go away and focus on other things and then come back after not playing for a while, you'll have a much larger amount of resources to spend than if you sat there and watched it the entire time. Now, I'm not talking from an optimal strategy perspective, but simply from a perceived enjoyment point of view. When you wake up and come back to your game that's been collecting money all night, you can spend it on bigger upgrades than if you kept buying smaller things as they became available. And if you stop playing entirely for let's say years at a time, you can come back to an inconceivable amount of cash to blow. But what you'll find is that when you take away the real time limitations by doing this, the entire game design philosophy falls apart. When I was in high school, my dad and I used to play Mafia Wars on Facebook, back when games were the main reason people made an account at all, and we were having a fun time with it until one day my dad got a weird glitch, and when he opened the game it had given him an obscene amount of money, way more than he could ever make normally. But instead of being excited about this, what he found was that the enjoyment of the game had totally gone away. Without the slow progression and building up of his assets, the game had lost all of its allure in one fell swoop. 
This is where games that actually get this stuff right really shine through. When I first booted up Stardew Valley, I realized it did everything Farmville tried to do but infinitely better, because it had taken out any element of real-time waiting. If you wanted to keep playing, grow more crops, or gain more resources, you just could right away. There was no asking your friends to help water your garden, or waiting 24 hours for green beans to sprout. It was balanced around playing at your own pace. You know, like what a game should really be about in the first place? It's your time and enjoyment after all, not Zynga's. Plus, when you start dealing with real world minutes and hours, it only invites other predatory practices to join in, like microtransactions to speed up the process, or buying a leg up to reach the next plateau even faster, which not only feels slimy just to talk about, but in the case of clickers defeats the actual purpose of playing the game in the first place. Edmund McMillan even made an incremental title himself called AVGM. The goal of this game was to click the light switch over and over until more items appeared in your room. It took more and more clicks in between each item as time went on, eventually reaching upwards of 10,000 clicks to beat the game. And what do you receive for finishing the gauntlet of doing nothing but clicking a light switch for over 30 minutes? The revelation of what the title actually stands for. Abusive Video Game Manipulation. At the end of the day, that's really what it is. Do you have to play them? Of course not. And I'm not saying you're a bad person for playing them, I'm guilty of this as well. But when you sit back and look at the big picture, they highlight how many different games can take advantage of our subconscious desires, to steal our money at the worst, but our time at the very least. And to me, in no way can it be considered good game design. They've sort of dropped off in popularity in recent years, but I've noticed the techniques that they employed are still cropping up all over the place, especially in the mobile game space. It's no secret that microtransactions seem to be the mainstream way to get people to pay for your free to download title these days. But I want to encourage you to support creators who are making actual quality experiences without predatory practices. And be sure to look out for the next big game that might try to swindle you behind your back. We've come a long way from horse armor DLC, and have accepted shady business strategies today that would have been unanimously condemned 10 or 15 years ago. I guess I'm just trying to say to be diligent, and make sure you know what you're getting into before you click on that next big shiny cookie. Thanks for watching another episode of Bad Game Design, I'll see you guys next time. Stay frosty my friends! Baba Is You is the best puzzle game I've ever played, and in fact maybe one of the best games I've played, period. For the uninitiated, this is a simplistic looking puzzler all about changing the rules to succeed. So for example, you may enter a level that seems impossible at first, but by interacting with the various words scattered around the stage, you can change the sequence that says wall is stop, so that you can move over walls and create the sentence flag is win to beat the stage. You quickly realize that the possibilities are endless here, so you can turn yourself into a rock, adjust what object is the goal you need to touch, and even warp the level in crazy ways that'll make your head hurt. It becomes apparent that Baba Is You is less about moving a little, I don't know, bunny, sheep. Wait a minute. Baba Is You. Holy frick! Baba Is You is less about moving a Baba around to reach goals and more about programming and coding. This is a game about game design. The hook is that there are literally over 200 levels. So much like other indie darlings such as Celeste or Super Meat Boy, it seems like the game never runs out of content and always has another trick up its sleeve. The trailer does a phenomenal job of showing what Baba Is You has to offer. And at first, I thought some of the rules it threw in were jokes. But nope, all of these mechanics are actually in there somewhere. Let me put it a different way. Every single time I've booted up the game, it's accomplished three major things. Teaching me something new, surprising me with some of its solutions, and blowing my freaking mind. I really can't say that about most games. So if this interests you in any way and you haven't played it yet, consider this my spoiler warning. The rest of this video will pick apart why I feel Baba Is You is already one of my games of the year and a must play even if you're like me and don't enjoy puzzle games that much. So pause this video and go try it out for yourself. Then come back later and let's talk about it.
Here's a little more about how Baba Is You operates. The game is split up into various worlds on an island, and each section has an overall theme, but also tons of mini mechanics that it'll teach you within. Early on you learn that if certain rules are on the edge of the screen or outside of your reachable area, they can't be changed. So in a way, these are the meta rules that you have to work with, while everything else in the middle of a stage is able to be manipulated. And for the most part, if it's put in there, it's for a reason. The most important modifier is you, because if it ever loses its object, you can no longer move and have to either rewind to a previous step or restart the stage. Other things can become you, but you have to change it in one move, otherwise you're just a cold dead husk. Also, rules only work top to bottom or left to right. You can't make a backward phrase, it doesn't work like that. So there are some limitations within the game's rules, but you'd be surprised how much you're able to modify. Baba Is You is a very hard game. In my first hour, it already made my brain feel like a sawmill trying to churn out concrete, but I will say the learning curve is very good. Because of the vast amount of levels, it takes you on a tour of all the different ways it'll bend what you thought was possible at a leisurely pace. So you only slowly lose your mind, not all at once. At first you learn the basics, such as things that sink in water, keys that open doors, or that you can even make yourself win for an easy victory. But eventually it'll add in more complexity, like teleporters, conveyor belts that push in one direction, objects that move on their own so you have to wait for them to finish a task, or the mind-melting X is X rule, which means that whatever object is reinforced cannot be changed, and your attempts at breaking the game are overruled. And those that have gotten pretty far into Baba is You know that this is only scratching the surface. What this leads to is puzzles that are full of epiphany moments. Often you'll be completely stuck for a long while, and then feel like a total dummy when you didn't see the correct answer right in front of you. Even further, many puzzles have multiple solutions. So when you think you finally found that tricky aha moment they were wanting you to find, you might come back later and realize there was an easier alternative that you could have done all along. I like that they include bonus levels that are just little adjustments of puzzles you've bested. So if you thought one stage was easy, they'll test you further and say, okay, but without that solution as an option, how would you solve this? It really feels like the developers thought of every possible situation and know where your mind is headed. Countless times I started a stage and thought I knew the answer right away, but then there was a hang up I didn't notice, and I couldn't help but be angry yet impressed at their ability to follow the player's logic, and make them take a step back to look for the correct path that isn't quite as obvious. Another thing that's pretty unique is that because of the static nature of each level, you can memorize their layouts and various puzzle pieces. So even if you're away from the game, you can still think on it and say, hmm, I didn't try that method yet, for when you come back to it later. The game builds to insane heights, where sometimes objects will hold other objects inside, so when they die, another thing pops out. Or you'll have to control two or more of the same character at once. Or even crazier, maybe you'll need to kill yourself by breaking the is you formula, but set it up in such a way that other things will move it back into place and you'll be past an immovable obstacle. Like what? It keeps adding more and more rule sets, like gravity, being close to a buddy, otherwise you get lonely, and the not modifier, which does exactly what you think. So you can make not Baba is you and control everything else on screen. But don't worry, not not Baba is still just you. <laughs> this game yet again keeps going, and into territory I haven't seen other games even touch upon, so I'm gonna go ahead and leave another spoiler warning here because from now on I'm getting into the real spicy stuff, like this is the kind of thing that you'll remember forever if you discover on your own, so you've been warned. Okay, on the map screen you get little dandelions for beating a stage, and flowers for completing a certain number of them within worlds, which unlock new gateways and even more areas. But what you might have ignored right in the corner is that there still is the Baba is you and flag is win rules. This is so simplistic I didn't think much of it either, until the game introduced the level mechanic. So by this point in the game, you're well aware that you can turn objects into other objects by saying rock is key for example. So as a joke, I thought, what if I made level is key, that probably won't do any- Whoa. Yeah, it actually made the level itself on the map a key. Which sure, gave me a quick laugh, but the implications are huge here. What if I can turn the level into something else, like Baba? 
Oh no. That's right, the map itself is a level. And if you turn another stage into flag, you can win the map screen. You ready? It's time to put on your meta shades. From here on out, you know that everything can be manipulated, and you're constantly looking for another opportunity to change levels into other things. The game is so much less about beating stages anymore, but about how to actually proceed outside of them to find the next one. And the game knows it, sometimes the win objective is super obvious, but you need to change the level to be able to unlock even more stages. Like I said, this game never ends, it's insane. If you turn one level into a rock and another into a baba, you can push it into the water to open the depths. And whoo boy, you become a skull, you gotta move the cursor onto yourself to move freely. But don't worry, even the cursor can become something else later on. You control empty space itself, you can unlock stages that have just letters that can spell out different words. You end up stacking different rules on top of each other to activate two things at the same time, there's rules that are hidden until you find them. You- oh man, I don't feel so good. Flag is end. Secret orbs? All is done. The Baba is you was the Baba is me all along. Almost one year ago, it seemed like the Mario Party series was making a triumphant comeback. After a couple underwhelming titles that changed too much of the core appeal, fans were excited to see a return to form, with individual movement across boards, and lots of new characters that each had their own unique dice blocks. Not to mention, they advertised online play with friends for a franchise first. It seemed like a slam dunk. But now, not only is Super Mario Party gathering dust on the shelf for most that bought it, it seems to be forgotten by Nintendo itself. How could such an easy win fall off people's radars so quickly? Welcome to another episode of Bad Game Design. Let's talk about it. I've put way more hours into Super Mario Party than I expected to. I even bought an extra set of Joy-Cons to make sure all my friends could play. And at first, it really was a smash hit. The minigames are excellent. And the addition of HD Rumble made for some really cool concepts that could only be possible on the Switch. They also added a ton of different features, like the co-op river run, a rhythm-based concert mode, and Challenge Road for the single-player experience. The problem is that the more you play, the less enjoyable it becomes, and the flaws start to take center stage. Obviously, the main attraction is party mode, but right away, you notice the game only has three maps, with one more unlockable over time. If that seems low, it's because every other title had at least five, sometimes six from the very start, and more you could unlock eventually. So immediately, the replayability and variety is greatly reduced compared to past entries. But to add insult to injury, the online play they boasted about is only for one particular mode where you face off against five minigames and declare a victor. No boards, no other game styles, just Mario-thon. Yikes. But the biggest gripe, and probably the most curious one, is that there has not been a single peep of upcoming DLC for the game. Launching with limited options is one thing, but unlike other less popular titles such as Mario Tennis Aces or ARMS, without any free updates or even paid additions to make the game more interesting, it starts to make sense how Super Mario Party could be dead in the water. Actually, I should say it did receive one update back in March, but it was a simple bug fix to make sure information was showing correctly. But I can't pretend that lack of support was the only thing wrong here. Adding more boards or new minigames couldn't save it from the other issues I had while playing countless matches with friends. Having four maps wouldn't be the end of the world if they were diverse and interesting to play, but after a single match of each, you realize they don't have a lot to offer. They're very linear, and more or less revolve around one main path with little to no shortcuts. Womp's Domino Ruins is a giant loop with tiny smaller loops along the way. There's really only one direction to go. Kamek's Tantalizing Tower is a straight line with almost no deviation, and the star is always at the top, so high rolls are objectively going to be better here. Very little strategy involved. 
Mega Fruit Paradise looks the coolest, but is just four smaller circles with little ability to travel between them. And King bob -omb's Powder Keg Mine is probably the best one, but only because it offers a single exit on each side through the middle. You still need to go around the big outer ring most of the time. Looking at past board layouts, two things are clear to me. They used to be much more intricate and complex in the choices you could make, but they also were a lot bigger. Simple and small is the name of the game here, and it makes sense when you account for the fact that each player's dice roll is reduced to a max of 6 now. But this brings a whole new set of problems with it. Having dice go from 1 to 10 of course is fitting when you have more ground to cover but it also increases the likelihood of getting a decent roll that makes you feel like you're progressing. Now, between a 1 and 6, the chance of barely moving along feels unavoidable. There are ways to increase this with items, but they only bump your dice by 3 or 5 at most. So getting that lucky combo of a massive roll and dominating the board is no longer possible here. You might say, but hey Snowman, each character has a special dice, remember? So you can get a 10, you just need to pick the ones who have it available to them. The issue here is that to compensate for a higher roll, the rest of the dice is reduced to zeros, or affecting your coins, which is also a zero. So if you choose Donkey Kong, for example, while yes, you could get a 10 every time, the chance of that happening is very low, and instead you might sit on the same space for multiple turns, and lose any momentum you may have had. There are allies to increase your roll by one or two, but you have to land on their spaces to receive them, otherwise you're out of luck. This combined with the long linear nature of the level layouts means that a star might spawn right behind you and it'll take 10 turns just to reach it again. It's hard enough to land on the right islands in the fruit stage as it is, but eventually the sand bridge goes out. So if you're here and the star spawns over here, you'd have to go all the way around and through two pipes to reach it. And by then, someone else will probably get it and move it over there again. The result is a game mode that feels very slow, and that's probably the single word I would use to describe Super Mario Party as a whole. Getting a star is grueling because you have to sit through this lengthy cutscene and then watch Toadette lazily drift over to her next location, every single time. I have no idea why they chose to do this, but whenever you start a new game and look at the map for the first time, it automatically makes you watch the toad tips of where the different routes go and how to get around. Helpful, yes, but please make it optional. Now I just avoid clicking the map button for fear of triggering it. You also can't avoid the final three turn spiel that drags on and on. You gotta see the standings, have a guest judge say who's gonna win, turn all spots into plus or minus six coins, and watch Kamek turn bad luck spaces into very bad luck spaces, ooh. This all would be okay if you could skip or speed it up, but there's no way to do that. So the longer you play, the more agonizing this becomes. You can skip other cutscenes or choose not to have the rules explained, so I don't know why they made these mandatory. And that's truly the nail in the coffin for me. There are virtually no option menus or ways to adjust anything. The oldest entries in the series had tons of ways to customize your experience. Mario Party 3 had handicap stars and custom number of turns, from 10 to 50. In Mario Party 2, you could turn bonus stars on or off. Heck, even the first title had individual difficulties for computer characters, and the ability to skip minigame instructions or speed up text. None of those features are present here. You have to have two bonus stars at the end, there's no way to add handicaps, and you can only play 10 to 20 turns, with a minimum game time of 60 minutes, which is twice as long as the original games. Look, I'll be the first to admit that as the series progressed, they did add more and more mechanics that slowed down the overall gameplay, Mario Party 7 being a particular culprit with Bowser minigames, dueling, shy guys all over the place, but at least they had interesting things happening. Say what you want about the desert map adding a mirage star that disappeared when you reached it, I'll take that any day compared to Super's bland designs of digging for coins, or rolling a boulder to push you back yet again, thanks Mario! There's so many questionable choices, like lowering the coin requirement for a star from 20 to 10, but then also changing minigames so that every player gets a handful, not just the winner. So as a result, everyone has a boatload of money by the end of the game. And with movement being so sluggish, this really only leads to one viable strategy. Farming golden pipes. They only cost 10 coins and take you straight to the star without fail. Golden pipes are very OP and super uninteresting. 
Now, to be clear, as I said, the mini games are phenomenal. In fact, the last several times I've played, that's all we did. Head over to our favorites list and have a grand old time. But even with other modes thrown in as valiant efforts, there wasn't enough meat on the bones to hold our attention. The bait and switch of the online play was a glaring missed opportunity, but the lack of any new content being added is the biggest head scratcher of all. There was enough outcry after Mario Maker 2 tried a similar tactic that they quickly changed their stance and will add true online with friends eventually. So I'm blown away that while other games have gotten loads of post-release attention, Super Mario Party, despite its promising elevator pitch, has continued to get the cold shoulder. Now, you could definitely make the argument that they're probably working on a sequel. There's clearly no shortage of other entries on the same console, so maybe they'll fix these complaints in a new title. And that could very well be true. But at least for now, a year after its initial release, we've heard no news on any front. Sequel, DLC, anything. So instead, we're wondering why they left a half-baked release untouched. Just to tease us enough to wet our whistle, but not enough to have a full experience. To wrap up, if they do end up creating a new entry instead, let's talk about what they could do to alleviate some of these issues. The obvious answer is to simply add more boards, but I don't even think they would need to reinvent the wheel here. What if they took the Mario Kart approach and threw in classic maps from the original games? It would be awesome to see the same clever layouts with an updated look, and a few tweaks to make them even more enjoyable. The charm of Mario Party 2, complete with outfits and ending cinematics fitting the theme, is yet to be matched in my opinion. I would also love to see way more options. Let me skip annoying cutscenes, customize my game settings, maybe even add specific bonus stars instead of just turning them on or off. That could add special challenge objectives in addition to collecting the most stars. I don't even mind the idea of having unique dice for each character, but they should definitely add more ways to travel farther. Bigger and more complex maps are preferred, but on top of this, it just feels more enjoyable when you're actually making progress, and have multiple ways to reach your goal. At the end of the day, the mini-games are arguably the most memorable part of Mario Party, but I think we look back at them so fondly because the whole package complemented those heart-pounding game nights with friends. No matter where the series goes from here, I hope they remember that all the pieces have to fall into place to stand the test of time. If you could create the perfect Mario Party game, what elements would you include? Did I miss anything that would really complete the experience in your eyes? Let me know in the comments below and let's talk about it. Thanks for watching another episode of Bad Game Design. I'll see you guys next time. Stay frosty, my friends. A humble indie game by Mobius Digital came out last year with little fanfare, and I'm ashamed to admit it took me this long to give it a go, despite its incredibly high reception from friends. But now, after diving in, I was pleasantly surprised to find that it's a game unlike anything else I've ever played. That game is Outer Wilds. Outer Wilds is a lot of things, a technical marvel, a pillar of good design, and an emotional journey. But it's wrapped up in what I can only describe as the openness of Breath of the Wild in space, and without a Ganon to push you forward. Exploration, discovery, and mind-blowing epiphanies are aplenty, yet it somehow does this without a single driving objective. This game is brilliant and we'll break down exactly why, but I wanted to give you the chance to escape before we get into the nitty gritty. Outer Wilds is best experienced without knowing a single thing about it, so if you're interested in any way, go give it a play first, and come back to discuss it with us afterward. Cool? Alright, welcome to another episode of Good Game Design. Let's talk about it. As an eager astronaut ready to take to the sky, you begin your adventure on the home planet of Timber Hearth. This cozy introduction is fantastic, because you can test out all the different mechanics you'll be using like controlling your ship, launching scout drones, and locating audio frequencies, but in a safe environment, before you're hurled into the cold vastness of space. And even better, they're completely optional. In fact, there's only one required conversation in the entire game, and that's to retrieve the launch codes from Hornfells at the observatory, which is strategically placed past all of these opportunities to learn, so you'll most likely see some of them along the way. 
but it makes sure you're the one choosing to engage with them, which you quickly find out is essentially the major theme of Outer Wilds. The only question Hornfells will ask is what you'd like to do out there in the great beyond, which disguises itself as an open-ended response, but cleverly gives you some ideas of where to get started too. Once you board the ship and take off, the entire solar system is quite literally yours to discover. There's no goal, no motive, or even a hint. The premise is to explore the stars. And what a universe it is. Almost immediately, I was blown away at what Outer Wilds achieved on a technical level. All of the planets are moving and rotating at the same time, and they're all on global timers with different quirks about them. Brittle Hollow is a fragile planet slowly getting sucked into a black hole over time. Giant's Deep is constantly storming and launching islands into the stratosphere, and the Hourglass Twins transfer pillars of sand from one planet to another through its gravitational pull, so one fills up over time while the other is emptied. All of this is happening simultaneously, so as you travel from globe to globe, any number of events could trigger as you arrive, and somehow this is all done without any loading screens, stuttering, or delays. It's seamless. Those aren't the only planets though, there's Dark Bramble, which is like a magic house, with many rooms that are much larger than they look from the outside. The Interloper, an icy comet that allows you to skate around its surface. Oh, and the Sun, which turns supernova and explodes after 22 minutes, killing you and everyone in the galaxy! But then you wake up again, somehow restarting in an endless loop, thanks to these mysterious figurehead statues. Hmm. You start to realize there might be more to this story than just seeing the cosmos. The kicker is that Outer Wilds is so much more than walking simulators like Gone Home. There's puzzles, platforming challenges, even detective work you'll have to do to find out what exactly is going on here. And your arsenal of gadgets are vital to your quest as well. So even though I said their tutorials are optional, I recommend making sure you know how to use them. You'll find all sorts of contraptions that seem totally foreign at first, but are easy to understand once you start tinkering around with them. Like these projection stones that give you a vision if you stand near them, or balls of light that move upon sight to activate switches or doors. Because you only have a limited time frame to uncover the secrets each planet is hiding, you need to plan ahead carefully, otherwise you'll stumble upon a great new discovery just as you meet your untimely end. It also will take much longer than a single day. There are so many threads to follow once you really get your feet wet. I started to feel like Charlie after a while. Luckily, there are little bits of good game design to help ease the pain of your constraints. Once you've gone through a specific set of instructions to reach a hidden area, there's often shortcuts you can uncover to journey right back to it quicker the next time. These are always here, you just didn't know about them yet. Time will stand still as you're reading text or analyzing your ship log, so you don't have to stress about running out of time if you're a slow reader or just want to reflect on the information. You can also doze off at the opening campfire to speed up the time limit for events that happen later in a cycle, or learn to meditate by talking to another explorer on Giant's Deep, which will end your current run and start fresh with the click of a button. That way you don't have to drive straight into the sun to kill yourself. Still, there's quite a lot to explore out there. Searching behind every crag and bushel would take forever, but the developers thought of this too. That's why there's not very much detail on every part of a planet. If there isn't anything to find in a particular area, they kept the location dull and boring. Flat surfaces, simple grass or rock. So when something of importance does catch your eye, you're immediately drawn to it and want to investigate. They also made sure each cavern or lost city with a lot of branching pathways led to the same central piece that they wanted to make sure you saw. While there's plenty of lore and side conversations to find, the most important bits of evidence have neon signs pointing to them through the world design and the logic of the player. Oh, here's a wall with an empty slot. Okay, I gotta find the matching scroll. Furthermore, the music and sounds of the Outer Wilds complement these moments of discovery. Specific tunes will play as you approach a new revelation, building in intensity, almost like saying, warmer, warmer. You're certainly directed toward the crumbs the alien race of Nomai left for you, but without any overt quest markers or checklists. The only guide is your curiosity, and I think that's pretty dang impressive to pull off. You can tell the concept of self-discovery was paramount to Outer Wilds' design. Everything else is put in there to enhance this driving force. There is an ending and final goal, but it's never stated outright. It's just hiding, waiting to be revealed. 
And because it's so carefully constructed to be that open-ended, this led to a game where every player's experience will be different. No one will probably have the same first run as I did. I flew to the closest thing I could find, Adle Rock, Timberhearth's tiny moon, and talked to a lonely wanderer there to ask some questions about the world. And then tried going to Brittle Hollow, but accidentally came in too hot and crashed my ship on the planet's surface. There was no way of fixing it, so I started to explore on foot. I didn't know that the game reset when you died at this point, so I started to get nervous about my depleting oxygen and fuel supply, and accidentally fell off the ledge and immediately got sucked into a black hole, which ironically led to the discovery of an important space station that taught me the basics of how teleportation works. In my next life, I exited my ship to repair something, but got blown away barely clinging to life as I drifted through space. The next time, I got overeager and sped into some ruins, only to realize I was stuck and will get crushed by the raising sand. Heck, I got straight up finding nemo by a freaking anglerfish the first time I entered Dark Bramble. That was terrifying. All of those experiences are mine, and no one else will have those moments quite the way I did. It's a game that gives you your own stories to tell, and builds an emotional connection to your journey and the universe you're exploring. The planets have a mind of their own, and will continue on their paths whether you're around or not, which made it feel like a true sandbox to play in. One where you can make up your own games and let your imagination run wild. One that lets you draw your own conclusions about what you find. One where you can sit around a campfire and share a marshmallow with a friend, as you reminisce about the lives you've lived. And that's a beautiful thing. When you reach the finale of 2008's indie classic Braid, you as the player get to witness Tim's reunion with the princess he's been trying to save for the entire game. She escapes the hands of her captor and cries for help, followed by an intense sequence where you help each other get away by opening doors and removing obstacles blocking your exit. When you reach the end, however, things aren't quite what they seem. If you rewind time, the game's signature mechanic, you realize Tim is the one hunting down the princess. And as you fight back through the same hallway, she releases traps and narrowly dodges your attempts at stopping her. The man at the end is actually her savior, and his dialogue takes on a whole new meaning. So using the exact same layout and path taken, an entirely different perspective emerges because of how the game frames your encounter. In game design, this principle is called... Actually, I have no idea. I've searched high and low and cannot find an answer, so I think we need to come up with a new term here. Should we call it cyclical design? The old switcheroo? Nothing quite conveys the trope I'm talking about here. But I liked the suggestion on Twitter from Andreas Graham of using all the buffalo. You know, like how the Native Americans never let a part of their hunt go to waste. So I think we'll go with that for the sake of this video. Let's be a bit more exact with what I'm talking about here. To define using all the buffalo, I would say it's when the same game assets, whether it's level design, enemies, or specific mechanics, are used in multiple ways to lend a fresh approach to the gameplay or highlight particular story beats. So in our braid example, it doesn't really change anything on a mechanical level. You just hold the rewind button and it plays out for you. But throughout the same game, there are several times where an identical room layout or setup is used to show how a new addition to the gameplay can really switch up the solutions to puzzles. You fight this same monster two separate times in Braid. The first teaches you that if you replace the broken chandeliers, he'll retain the damage he received. But the second one makes it slightly harder by requiring the shadow version of the chandelier to do the damage, so that you can release it multiple times. So while you could simply change the scenery of a game to show a stark contrast like the town square in Ocarina of Time, or to evoke certain emotions like the minute changes to the hallway in PT, it feels much more impactful and recognizable if it affects the gameplay in some way. It's almost easier to explain what this principle isn't rather than what it is. I'm not talking about when a stage has multiple paths like Sonic the Hedgehog, that's just building more areas to explore if you're skilled enough to reach them. And I'm also not talking about aesthetic nods, like Tropical Freeze's Last World paying homage to each of the areas in DKC Returns. While it's nice to reminisce about their predecessors, they're still completely different levels. Now obviously these are fantastic elements to include in your game design. They just aren't quite using all the buffalo. We're talking about taking the exact same elements and repurposing them to switch things up. Let's look at a few more examples. 
The Messenger prides itself on using time portals to switch between 8-bit and 16-bit versions of its stages. But this is much more than just a graphical improvement. Certain pathways become blocked off or open up depending on which timeline you're in. And it'll change up hazards like the empty cloud ruins becoming a lightning-filled temple when you jump to the past. Wario Land 4 does something similar. Once you reach the end of a level and flip the switch, you need to backtrack to the beginning to leave. But some of the route you took is now obstructed, forcing you to explore and find a new way home. Now, what about enemy and obstacle design? Well, in Celeste, the very fireballs you're trying to avoid become helpful jump pads when you transform the level into its icy version. And the freaky eyeball monsters that hunt you down also provide a forceful boost when they come back to life. Scary to attempt, but a really cool little quirk. Rayman Legends is masterful at this. In the fourth world, they introduce these searchlights that you need to stealth your way around, otherwise you'll get a nasty shock. But that simple device is expanded in a variety of different ways. These spiky eels can harm you, but they also block the light. You can move wooden planks to hide behind, but also platform across. You even break into a mansion, cut the lights, and then have to sneak your way back past the added security. Something I found super clever was that they used identical copies of stages from Rayman Origins, but added in the newer collectibles of Teensies in different hiding spots. And that's probably the most blatant example of what we're talking about here. Oh, also, they have these belly-flopping luchadors that not only serve as menacing obstacles and a way to cut through the walls of cake, but also something we haven't mentioned yet. Humor. You literally jump and kick enemies to the beat of Black Betty in this game. It's so freaking good, you guys. This can even apply to the player's mechanics as well. In Wandersong, you sing to do just about everything. Communicate with others, make choices, but it also is used for numerous purposes in the game's dungeons. You can sing in a circle to make time move forward or backward, shout in a particular direction to guide platforms, and even belt out specific tunes to cause ledges to appear like a fighting game combo or something. The note wheel never changes, but how you interact with the world can be wildly different depending on where you are in the story. And just when you think you've seen all it has to offer, it innovates with a new ability. So why is this important? What are the benefits of using all the buffalo? Well, to me, it helps a game feel more dynamic and like every element has a purpose. Instead of requiring a giant number of assets that pile up with each new challenge, this lets very few pieces go much further to keep things tidy and neat. And frankly, just feels cleverly designed when I see it. Like more thought went into every aspect when it was being created. This is obviously easier said than done, however, and requires a lot of planning and how it will all piece together. But if it's a part of the design philosophy from the get-go, it can have a massive impact on how enjoyable the experience is. To prove my point, let's take a look at the best example of using all the buffalo I could find, a Kaizo Mario ROM hack called Bun Bun World 2. I know I keep talking about Mario World hacks, but this one literally inspired the entire video, so uh, sorry. Let me walk you through some of the genius here, and maybe it can help inspire some future ideas for game developers out there. From the very first stage, it shows how effective this whole looping back on itself stuff can be. After going through the bottom part of the stage and entering a pipe, it shoots you out from an earlier spot at a much faster speed. And if you maintain that momentum, you can travel on the roof and over the same obstacles to reach the ending. That feels incredible to pull off. The second level has some cool repurposing, like this spike ball that's a hazard when you're coming from the left, but when you respawn it from the right side, you can spin jump on it to reach the higher ledge. But the secret exit is even cooler. Here, you need to avoid the green platforms because if you land on them, the ceiling will start to collapse and make it impossible to proceed. But about halfway through, you're required to trigger it, and then have to survive long enough bouncing on these dinos for the wall to lower and allow you to clear it. One more level design example for good measure. This stage is like Hazy Maze Cave. If you spend too much time in the fog, you suffocate. So here, you need to reach the far side to grab a gray pea switch, which then allows you to destroy the munchers and backtrack on a newly available route back to the entrance where a pipe is now open. The same hallway feels like an entirely new area. 
But it's not just the layouts. Hazards respawning when you come from the other side are all over the place. Almost every new obstacle has a different perspective to it by the time you reach the goal. And they even utilize vanilla Mario World mechanics like the cape in basically every way possible. Floating, flying, spin jumps, invincibility frames, and ground pounding to kill enemies are all present in the same level. Each stage only focuses on a couple elements at a time, and pushes them to their absolute limits. Which really makes the whole game feel cohesive, and like every pixel of an object's placement is important and perfectly calculated. In fact, that's really what Kaizo is all about. Since there's only one correct way to go in these gauntlets of death, every piece matters, and when everything is working together to show you the right path, it feels like a well-oiled machine. They'll also throw in some clever trolls now and again to make you think outside the box, and discover the new angle you need to hit that green orb. I think what makes Bun Bun World 2 so special is that even typical Kaizo tropes are turned on their head. Usually when you gain a power-up, it's used to damage boost past an unavoidable death trap. But in this level, you need to keep it through the gold tape, otherwise you'll be too small and fall to your demise. <sighs> I'm like, mad, but also not at the same time. The funny thing is, fan-made creations like this are often the best at using all the buffalo. And I think it's due to their inherent limitations. Because creators only have so many options in terms of what assets to use, they have to get creative in how they're implemented. If you're building a new game from scratch, it might be easier to just make another enemy or power-up to serve a function. But taking an already established game and seeing just how far you can stretch it is what makes them so unique. Part of the charm of a hack or Mario Maker level is seeing items you thought you understood in new ways, and making you rethink how to use them. So is using all the buffalo the best design principle out there? Of course not. Every aspect of a game world doesn't have to have multiple purposes, sometimes a sword is just a stabby thing to kill stuff with. But then again... And look, I'll be the first to admit this is much easier to implement in platformers than other genres. But at least in principle, I think it can be used to great effect even in subtle ways. Can you think of any other examples of using all the buffalo in games? What's an experience that just blew your mind when you realized there was a whole other aspect to something you thought was more simple? Let me know in the comments below and let's talk about it. Seriously though, you need to check out Bun Bun World 2. It made me feel smarter just for playing it and that is pretty freaking sweet. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Stay frosty my friends. The older I get, the more I realize there are certain game elements that can either make or break an experience for me. For example, if a game sends endless waves of the same enemies at me over and over again, even if the mechanics are interesting, I'm sent straight to Snoozeville. Likewise, shooters in general I find rather boring nowadays. But if a game has some gorgeous pixel art, I'm already a bit more intrigued. Obviously I'm talking personal preference here, but perhaps the most important aspect to me in this regard is also one that's fundamental to a game's design. Movement. You've probably heard someone say that a game just feels good to play and move around in. But what exactly causes that? It's not like games automatically come that way, it clearly takes a lot of playtesting and polish to reach that perfect level of smoothness, and I've come up with several different pieces that need to work together in order for that to be the case. Welcome to another episode of Good Game Design. Let's talk about it. First and most obvious is simply speed, right? Or at least being able to go at a speed that you would like. Nothing is more agonizing than watching your character move at a snail's pace with no way to go any faster. Most games fix this by having a run button, so you can walk when you need to or speed things up as you'd like. But it's not just about being quick. Moving at Mach 5 can be just as frustrating if the game doesn't have a sense of flow. The way a series of obstacles and jumps link together and work in tandem seem to have a greater impact on the feeling of satisfaction I get than blazing through as fast as possible. Ghost Runner is one of the best at this I've seen in recent memory. Using your dash, grapple hook, time slow to dodge bullets, and sword to cut down enemies left and right in such quick succession feels incredible when you finally pull it off. This is a very fast paced game, so another way it keeps the flow going is by letting you quick retry by pressing R, so you never lose momentum waiting for a death animation or something, you set the pace of the action. 
Games with good flow don't have a lot of waiting around, and they easily telegraph what you need to do next so there's no confusion about where to go or what input to press. This is hard to pull off when you're moving at such fast speeds, so using bright colors or big identifiable landmarks to draw your attention go a long way into making the course of events feel natural. On top of this, it really helps when the player gets strong feedback from the game when they pull off a desired action. Now, this comes in the form of having tight and responsive controls, but also lots of juice and visual flair. It's almost a given that the game doing exactly what you want it to when you press a button lets you feel more in control of your character. But uh, look at Hades and all the cool particle effects that flash on screen when you dash around. In fact, this is borderline too much feedback. Sometimes it can clutter the screen and be hard to tell what's happening when you pulverize baddies. But all I know is it feels awesome when you hastily and flawlessly clear out a room. Crumble is another good example. Once you reach those breakneck speeds, it adds these whooshing lines around the edge to really make it feel like you're busting through the sound barrier or something. I would also say a great aspect of positive feedback is giving more grace to the player even when it shouldn't technically be possible. Celeste, as many of you know, helped popularize the term coyote time, where it still lets the player jump for a few additional frames after falling off a platform. In a game all about precision, the key to making it feel manageable and fostering its encouraging atmosphere is leaning toward forgiveness instead of keeping its rigid rule set in place. Shovel Knight also does this with King Knight's campaign. If you bash in the air and accidentally get hit, it refills your ability to bash again, which lets you do some quick recovery work and save yourself from a potential death. The beauty of Extra Grace is that you may not even realize the developers did it, and instead it just translates to better feeling controls and like you were the epic gamer who pulled off a crazy trick. The next thing that makes players feel empowered in their movement is having multiple options in how to get around. Being able to cross wide expanses or scale buildings with a variety of different moves leads to greater player expression and freedom, not to mention the glorious epiphany they get when they discover the different ways to complete objectives. Wings of V may be the only game I'm aware of that stores your ability to jump until you hit the jump button. Let me explain, say you have a double jump and fall off a platform. You only have one more jump before you run out, right? Well, not in Wings of V. You would still have both jumps available, and the entire game uses that to your advantage, making crazy level layouts that look impossible totally doable when you combine your jump, float, slide, and dash moves together. It's a spectacle to be sure. But it goes further than character mechanics. Being able to decide when you want to move can be equally as satisfying. Check out Rift World 2, a brand new ROM hack by Freakin' Ha. Unlike other Kaizo hacks, there's actually quite a lot of breathing room and safe ledges to rest on in this game, which makes the blistering challenge a lot more reasonable. But if you want to, all the cycles line up perfectly so that you can rush through without slowing down. This is a great way to motivate the player to learn slowly and safely at first, and then work toward mastery as you get further into the stage. Once you feel confident in a section, you can breeze through without having to wait. It's always a plus in my book when the hazards and obstacles in a stage fall into place, so you can truck by without a second thought once you've internalized the patterns. And I mean, we've all experienced the opposite, right? Having to wait for a spinning platform or path to open up, it's maddening. What goes hand in hand with this is when a game will reward the player for their skill. Like in the Pathless, you gain a speed boost whenever you hit these archery targets and it fills your stamina meter as well. When you run out, things slow way down to a light jog. But if you can get the timing right of chaining your shots together, you'll never lose your speed. Combine this with aerial tricks, gliding with your bird friend, and even faster boosts and higher jumps later on, and you have a movement system that ends up feeling more like a rhythm game or something. Very unique. Last but not least, I think when a game uses its movement tech for more purposes than just running fast, it drastically adds to its cohesiveness and overall polish. Take Donkey Kong Country. The animal buddies not only increase your speed and survivability, but you can glide with Espresso, jump extra high with Winky, or break open walls with Rambi to explore and find all of its hidden secrets as well. In many titles, your dashes and rolls might get you around faster, but they also can be useful in combat too. Anytime a game uses its abilities to do more than just move left or right, it opens up a whole new world of possibilities, including the chaos that speedrunners unfold when they use these moves in unintended ways. I called this using all the buffalo in my last good game design. Check it out here if you happen to miss that episode.
Now, all of this is fine, but it's worth mentioning that not every game has to have these elements to feel rewarding or like it has good controls. Games like Castlevania and Dark Souls are notorious for how strict and slow their movement is. I mean, this is the only way to go upstairs, like, come on! But it depends on what the game's structure and goals are. These are much more methodical and cautious adventures, where each input you make could be a one-way ticket to your death. So their level of speed makes a lot more sense. Sense. And when you do change the formula, it can completely alter the feel of the experience. I think a lot of games have serviceable movement. They get the job done, but they don't really excel or stay memorable. But the best ones combine the various elements we discuss together, and work in harmony to create a diverse and enjoyable journey. One that lets a player's creativity shine and feel like the sky's the limit. What about you? What do you think are the most effective tools in building a gratifying movement system? What are some games that feel the best to move around in? Let me know in the comments below and let's talk about it. Thanks for watching another episode of Good Game Design. I'll see you next time. Stay frosty, my friends.